Welcome to A Time for War. I am your host, Saint Militant, the patron saint of combating false ideologies. This is a Christian podcast for those who understand the times we live in and their enemies. All right, guys. Welcome back to the show. I really hope you enjoyed that last one. I had a lot of fun doing that with my friend uh, Anthem. It was a good time. Like I said, taking a little little bit of a break before we get back into this whole discussion of kind of right-wing thought, fascism, World War II, 20th century ideologies, and all this different stuff, and of course Christianity. But we're going to do that today. I'm very excited to do this. Um, I put a lot of work, once again, into like a PowerPoint, just kind of getting ready for this. But before we get into it, I hope uh, you enjoy this episode, and we can have further discussions, of course. And remember to subscribe, uh, like the video, share with your friends, and please leave a comment. I really do actually try to answer a good amount. Um, and really, if you have uh, you have a question or maybe a video you would like me to go over or anything like that, please uh, just uh, send me an email, um, and I will try to answer, and I most likely will answer as fast as I possibly can. So guys, very excited to get into this. So. What we're going to do today is um, I did put a post on the community notes essentially saying that we will be reading out of what's called the Doctrine of Fascism by um, the man who invented essentially the term fascism, uh, Benito Mussolini. And he wrote the Doctrine of Fascism in 1932. It's the, the text itself uh, is about 20 pages. I have it on a PDF through archive.org. And the whole thing is about 33 pages. That's including the appendix. So I'm personally not going to read the appendix. I'm just going to go through this. So the question here, guys, is why am I going to read this? Well, the reason why I'm going to read this is because, as you see, the title of the episode is the question, why are Christians called fascists? Because as I started to kind of go down this route of, like, theonomy, and, uh, yeah, just studying God's law, like, you don't even have to get subscribed into the whole theonomy thing. If To be honest with you, a lot of those theonomists are actually kind of, like, libertarian-leaning, and I'm not kind of there. Uh, I kind of left libertarianism, right? I do call myself right-wing. Um, but so, like, that's kind of, like, the route they take. Like, I think of, like, Joe Boot today where he's like, we need to get back to, like, the Puritans. And, like, I've even found myself disagreeing with guys, even, like, Jeff Durbin and Guys like them who are like, we just need like good old puritanical republicanism. And I'm just kind of like, nah, I like I don't I just don't really get that anymore. And essentially why I'm asking this question, why are Christians called fascists, especially as I just pointed out, many of them kind of have libertarian leanings who are in theonomy. But when I was really studying God's law and I really started to go into this, I really started to say things out loud, um, especially at my old church. And I would just get these like really, really insane um, reactions, right? Like people would like legitimately be terrified of what I was saying. They'd be like, you're authoritarian, you're crazy. And in, in the moment guys, like I had no idea what they were talking about. Cause like, to me, I was just like, well, this is just like, isn't this just like Christian thought? Like, isn't this what Christians believe? Like this is based on God's law. Like God tells us to do this in his law. And if God laws like apply, especially if we just do even just general equity theonomy, right? Because um, I don't believe God's laws are universal, but there is like a kind of like you can use it and the laws are any time a nation kind of applies these laws um, in their nation, they tend to do extremely well, right? Like that's kind of like our nation. Uh, Britain was like this, like starting with King Alfred, Justinian is always a great example um, stuff like that. I always just find that nations do well when they were implementing these things. And then not only that, but when I would explain my ideas through God's law, I would get called a fascist. And I would be like, what, what I, 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 don't, I would honestly say like, well, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. Or I would just kind of deny it and be like, no, I'm not a fascist, but like I am right wing or like, I, that's usually how I would respond. So essentially what I just started to do was I started to read fascists for themselves. And what I found very quickly was, oh, yeah, I actually do agree with a lot of what they say. <laughs> and the one document I read that really made me go, huh, there's a lot here that, like, I actually think biblically really holds up, um, be especially being a theonomist, like, you know, holding the God's law and wanting to use it. And just my worldview with that is I found myself agreeing with 
guys like Benito Mussolini in many ways. So um, when people and it was funny, I was reading some of the stuff before I came on the show to my wife. I just started reading some of the doctrine of fascism and she goes, oh, I believe that. And I said, right, <laughs> me too. Um, not because like I'm a fascist, but because um, I think a lot of that has to do with God's law. So I did make a PowerPoint for us today. Um, just wanting to uh, show you guys kind of what I'm going to do here is before we get like what I want to do here is um, before we get into um, Benito Mussolini's doctrines of fascism, what I wanted to do is do this PowerPoint for you. Just it's all scripture pretty much. And then I ask like a question at the end uh, for at least egalitarians. And um, I just want to show you just scripture where I just got these ideas. And to be honest with you, this PowerPoint could have been like a thousand times longer. I honestly could have probably put like 30, 40 uh, like quotes here from the Bible and just like made an even bigger case. But just for the sake of time and just getting into the reading, um, th I just wanted to show you this. So um, I just called this, why are Christians called fascists? So here we go. Here is the first one. Um, it's because, uh, according to, I would argue, Second Chronicles 15, 3 through 6, a nation without law and strong leadership is doomed. So it says this, For many days Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. But in their distress they turned to the Lord God of Israel and they sought him and, they, and he let them find him. In those times there was no peace for him who went out, uh, uh, went out or him who came in because many disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. The nation was crushed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every kind of distress. Now, the thing I'm pointing out here and what you're going to hear from Mussolini a lot is that ne there needs to be a teaching, like a leader. Um, and if you notice, this was without law. So what was happening in Italy during the time is there was communists causing anarchy and they were actually disrupting the Italian parliament uh, and socialists were causing a lot of problems with like work riots, um, people not getting arrested for things they should have been. That should sound familiar, right? And they didn't have anybody to kind of lead. So that's kind of one thing is a nation without law and strong leadership is doomed, right? It just kind of nation was crushed by nation, city by city, for God troubled them with every kind of distress, which is what happened in the 20th century after World War One, right? So here's the next thing. He then restored the altar of the Lord. This is Second Chronicles 15.8. And this is why I said it usually takes a strong leader to change the culture of a nation. Now, if you heard my conversation with Anthem the other day, I did kind of uh, allude to this, that he said, you know, it comes down to the Great Commission and preaching the gospel. And it kind of starts from the bottom up, which I think is true. That's to a point. But I, what I have seen, especially reading like the book of First and Second Kings and then the book of First and Second Chronicles, there's a major theme where. When the ruler is wicked, the people are wicked. When the ruler is righteous, um, not usually perfect, by the way, but when the ruler is righteous, the people then become righteous, right? This is why the book of Judges is so interesting, because there was no ruler. They had a judge that would show up every once in a while. So here's what it says. Now, when Asa heard, that the, uh, heard these words and the prophecy which uh, Azariah, the son of Oded, the pro prophet, spoke, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had captured in the uh, hill country of Ephraim. He then restored the altar of the Lord, which was in the front of the porch of the Lord. So I just find that important because he goes in there and restores uh, not only just political order, uh, but religious order. OK, and once again, the reason why I'm showing you guys this is um, when we start reading Mussolini, a lot of this is going to be kind of what he mentions. So here's another one. All Judah rejoice concerning the oath. Second Chronicles 15, 12 through 15 says this. A nation lives and moves together as a unit led by a strong leader. They entered into the covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord of God, the God of Israel was was to be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. Moreover, they made an oath to the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting, trumpets, and with horns. All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and had sought him earnestly, and he let them find him. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. Now, I could have gone way deeper into this, right? But um, you see this a lot even in uh, like the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the book of Numbers, even Exodus, 
is but I the book of Deuteronomy especially is when Moses reads rereads the law it's everybody like even the children are there they're babies like the the Bible really specifically mentions that a lot of the times children are baby and babies are there which is really interesting and so um that happens a lot even in uh like later too um in like the um New Testament that happens a lot or the dedication of the temple in the Old Testament Anytime something really big happens, the whole nation is together, moving together, dedicating together as one unit, Um, which once again, one thing Mussolini is going to point out a lot is that he's going to use the word the state, but he really means nation and how the nation is moving together, is being moved, um, is being united. Um, Individualism is still there, but it's about the concerns of the nation and the health of the nation. And so that's kind of what I find in scripture also. Um, I thought this was really interesting. He removed Maka, 2 Chronicles 15, 16. So this was King Asa. So uh, this is what I was kind of talking about. The nation comes before the individual. Uh, this is verse 16. He also removed Maka, the mother of King Asa, from the position of queen mother because she had made an abominable image as in as an Asherah, and Asa cut down her abominable image, crushed it, and burned it at the brook of Kidron. So he actually put his mother behind him and the Lord before him. And not only that, the nation, right? He's not only is he following God and what he's doing, but he's protecting his nation by taking uh, wicked rulers. um, Because that's the thing. Women don't rule in the nation of Israel, but they do have advice, right? So they they had the queen mother, kind of like a regent almost um, in some cases. There was a queen that did rule Israel once, but she wasn't supposed to be there, and she did a lot of evil things. So <laughs> that's always, uh, um, that's not always uh, the best, you know what I mean? So here's the next thing. So that's why I always love Asa put his nation before his mother. So here's another thing. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord. I, I read this the other day, man. I was really moved by this. Second Chronicles 17, 3 through 6. A love and pride in godly law and order. And the law was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father Father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals, but sought the, the God of his fathers, followed, uh, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. So once again, the people are wicked, but the ruler is coming in and establishing. Right. So remember, there's a separation here, but Israel is wicked during the time because I think they have Ahab. Because um, I don't think, I think not too long after this, uh, Jehoshaphat makes the mistake of working with Ahab. So um, and it says this, so the Lord established the kingdom in his control and all Judah gave tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. And here's the great line. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord and again, removed the high places and the ashram from Judah. So I'm relating this to kind of the fascist movements of the early 20th century, because one of the first things that you will see that the like both like Mussolini and Hitler will do is they will start to remove really, really wicked institutions. They'll make certain things illegal. Um, like I, I found out like in uh, Hitler's regime, he makes like abortion illegal. Um, this is why like even about the thoughts of the, his euthanasia program, I, I kind of question that stuff because there's a little bit of a contradiction ne- there. So y- he could have had a euthanasia program. That's according to a lot of these Holocaust websites that apparently he had that. Um, like, it, and it could be true, right? I, I do find eugenics uh, kind of riddled through 20th century right wing thought. Um, I was listening to a right-wing guy le- recently. He was kind of <laughs> like advocating for it, and I was like, nah, this ain't it, right? Um, so, But I, I, I go back and forth because even guys like Mussolini will get rid of um, – will get rid of uh, like things like abortion and homosexuality. All of that stuff will become illegal, and they will want righteousness and righteous laws for their people, uh, which I always found very interesting. And uh, it seems like they took great pride in their country being moral. That's like one thing you'll really find. Um, so here's uh, kind of striving from the leadership thing. But I, I said this. He made from one man every nation. This is Acts 17, 26. Uh, nationalism is seen as a good because God made the made them himself. So this is Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man, that's Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Now, I always point to this, guys, um, to counteract um, internationalism amongst Christians. 
where I say, I'm sorry, but like there's no example of internationalism found as a good thing in the Bible. If anything, nationalism is usually found. The nation. This I, this could even be an ethnicity, um, anything like that, tribe. Those people and boundaries are given uh, from the Lord. Uh, even the evil ones. Um, one thing I love in God's law is that God even gives the descendants of Lot their land, which I always thought was really interesting because they were not righteous people. But one thing I love is that the Lord actually gives land to, uh, I forget which tribes, but he gives it to them um, because of their ancestors. So he appoints their times and boundaries, and then those nations disappeared, right? Their time had ended, and their boundaries were gone. And this is what we see all the time, right? The Aztecs are not here anymore, Um, like, um, those kind of tribes are kind of gone in general. You know, Austria-Hungary doesn't really exist in the form it does, right? And so Ottoman Empire is another one. Uh, Rome is gone, right? All these different things. So I always just thought this was really interesting, and this is why internationalism is not a Christian belief. That's more of a liberal communist belief. Um, and I think nationalism is actually seen as a good. Um, and uh, here's a... Uh, man did what was right in his own eyes, Judges 17, 6. Uh, individualism is not always presented as a good for a nation's health. Um, and it says this, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the thing. Everybody was an individual. Everyone got to do what they wanted to do. No more law, no more king. Uh, there was really no establishment of leaders and righteousness through law. There's no strong rulers. Uh, you know, a judge would show up every once in a while, kind of fix it and save them from something, but then they'd go right back into their, as you could say, almost their individualistic, uh, pluralistic society of people worshiping their own gods and worshiping God in whatever way they feel. Um, this is kind of what we see today, and it's individualism is just not presented as a good for a nation's health. It's just not. Um, I've just never seen that in the Bible. I just, I have never seen that ever. All right. Here's a, uh, here's another one. It's a, there shall not be found. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 11. Religious freedom, pluralism in the liberal sense, is not found in the Bible, but is rejected. Uh, so there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or, da- or his daughter pass through the fire. I usually connect that to abortion, by the way. I think passing through the fire is the same thing as like an abortion, people who support abortion. Uh, one who uses divination or a, sooth- a soothsayer, one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell or a medium or a spiritist or one who consults the dead. Now, I always connect this to today because people get to do this all they want, right? I, I went on um I man, I went on a few dates when I was like in college and dude, I'd gone on a date with this girl, and this would be before I was a believer, and the girls would be talking about crystals and, you know, all that gay crap and talking about spirits and talking to the dead, and I would just be like, This is so gay. But that kind of stuff is just that people consider that religious freedom. Right. People listen to what people say today and they you know, they say things like, oh, well, we have religious freedom. And it's like I always ask the question, do you do you actually have religious freedom according to God's law? And you know what the answer is? No, no, you don't. And um, that's why I reject this idea that when the founding fathers made the First Amendment and they say, oh, religious freedom, they were talking about bringing over Muslims and Hindus and spiritists and mediums and all that. Joseph Smith used to have had to run away. The Mormons had to literally run away from the U.S. government because the U.S. government was going after them because of their cult. Now, once again, what does this have to do with fascism? Well, if you look into the different religions that Hitler and even Mussolini um, got rid of, they got rid of like uh, they made it illegal to be a Jehovah's Witness, uh, a Freemason, um, Mormon, uh, Spiritism, occultists. Now, there's, of course, thoughts that Himmler and others were occultists inside the Nazi regime. Once again, I, I don't know. I go back and forth on that because Hitler himself made that stuff illegal. You could not bring that into Nazi Germany. That was illegal. And he did. He put, and you, you can disagree with this, but he put Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and others, and Freemasons into camps. He got rid of them. He exiled them or he put them into camps because he saw them as dangerous to uh, the Nazi or um, to uh, to the German people. He viewed them as cults. Uh, he did not allow religious freedom, and so and Mussolini did not either. Mussolini will have more of a Roman Catholic fo- focus, of course, um, and he'll pretty much say that Roman Catholicism is the religion for uh, for Italy, essentially. But 
yeah, guys, I'm sorry, but religious freedom and pluralism in the liberal sense is not found in the Bible. So here's another example. Uh, shun adultery. Uh, here, this is Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 11. If your brother, your mother's son, or your son or daughter, or the wife you cherish, or your friend who is like your own soul, entices you secretly, saying, let's go and serve other gods, whom neither you nor your fathers have known, of the gods of the peoples who are around you, near you, or far from you, from one end of the earth to the end to the other end, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, and your eye shall not pity him, or shall, uh, nor shall you spare or conceal him. Instead, you shall most certainly kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you shall stone him to death, because he has attempted to drive you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then all Israel will hear about it and be afraid and will not do such a wicked thing among you again. So when, when people hear this today, a lot of people go like, oh, my gosh, that's so harsh. Dear Lord, that's crazy. Um, but I remember when I started getting into theonomy and I remember really studying this and even like reading commentaries from like Matthew Henry. One thing I loved about Matthew Henry is he was just like, no, this is a good and righteous law. And it is good to get rid of people in your midst um, who worship demons, who worship false gods and uh, bring in evil into your country. And I used to make this argument all the time, especially the last line, then all of Israel will hear about it and be afraid and will not do such a wicked thing among you again. And one thing I always said to people who were started to reject my ideas of when I used to say things like, yeah, I think murder should be automatically, you know, death penalty. Um, I even said adultery should have the death penalty uh, because it's and, and, and the reason why I used to make these arguments is based on verse 11. It's because people will be afraid and they won't do that wicked thing. And this is why I, I genuinely believe in harsh punishments on people. I don't believe in this sense of I don't really agree with prison. I, um, I you know, I usually do the biblical kind of punishments. I think those are those are best. And now is there a form of jail like a holding area? Sure, but I don't believe in prison. It doesn't fix anything. And the reason why you put such harsh penalties, even on things that we think are crazy to put on, like adultery, is it's God is trying to severely defend the family. And when you break up the family, it destroys the nation. And the nation starts to go downhill. Hence why we're seeing what we see today. No fault divorce. Uh, making it easy to do that, um, to just divor divorce your partner or your, uh, your husband or your wife. Just because you feel like it. And um, I'm sorry, but like I just don't see that in the Bible. And when I would make these arguments, people would lose their minds. And if you noticed, it, you are to put some of the death who is trying to bring these gods amongst your people. That is not pluralism. That's not religious freedom. They, right? That's, that's very serious. Why would God be that serious about that? Well, because if you bring in these evil, evil gods or ideologies or whatever, and you dabble in this stuff, it destroys not only your family, not only the individual, but did you notice who also gets in into it first? It's then all the people. It's your nation. And that's one thing I've really learned from these fascist writers is they focus on the nation. It's whatever is good for your people. And look, just the opinion I've started to have is like that makes a lot of sense. And I think the Bible like this really supports it. I, I think it's really hard to argue against it. Um. Here's another one. Take all the leaders of the people and execute them. Numbers 25, 1 through 5. Well, Israel remained in Shittim. Shittim? I'm Shittim. <laughs> Is it Shittim? Shittim? <laughs> the people began to commit infidelity with the daughters of Moab. Moab. For they invited the people to the, to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel became followers of Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry with Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And you notice who, you notice who gets the punishment? It's the leaders. It's so interesting. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill his men who have become followers of Baal Peor. Once again, we, we hear this with our modern ears, and people go, how? That's so crazy. God is so harsh. Well, the reason why you put these kinds of people to death is to save your people. You have to do hard things. You have to get rid of these wicked rulers and people 
to save your nation. It makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. All right. And uh, here's uh, here's here's where we're going to talk about democracy because Mussolini's going to have a lot to say about democracy. So here's what it says. And the Hong Kong congregation said to them, Numbers 14, 1 through 4, democracy is never shown to be a good. This is true, by the way. <laughs> then all the congregation, by the way, notice the verbiage, not some of the congregation. What does it say? All the congregation raised their voices and cried out, and the people wept that night. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the entire congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or even if we had died in this wilderness. So why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. They're voting. They're going, hey, we need to get out of here. The Guys, this is why this generation is destroyed. And the book of Deuteronomy is then written for this next generation that will then enter the promised land. And they make mistakes, too. Um, but look at that. Everybody, all the congregation, raised their voices and cried out. All right? That's, that's democracy. Right? People are voting. They want to get rid of Moses, who's been a good ruler, by the way. Hasn't even been a bad ruler, which is hilarious. All right? Here's a, here's a good example. Now I'll point a king for us. 1 Samuel 8, 5 through 9. Democracy is never shown to be a good. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old. They're talking to Samuel, by the way. This is the people. And your sons do not walk in your ways, which is true. Now appoint us a king to judge us like all the nati- nations. Now you have to catch that. That's their motivation. That's not a good motivation. But the matter was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people regarding all that they say to you, because they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, and that they have abandoned me and served other gods. Pluralism. So they are not, th- so they are doing to you as well. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall warn them strongly and tell them of the practice of the king who will reign over them. Right? So, that's the thing, and, and if you read Deuteronomy 17, there are rules and regulations on a king that would eventually be put in place, so God, of course, knew that was going to happen, which is, I, that's why I love the Bible, because even just little things like that, um, because, of course, Israel at first was not a kingship in the sense of there was a, there were a monarchy, they didn't have a monarch, their king was, it was a theocracy, and uh, and had rulers that would, you know, elders, uh, and the Moses at the top, essentially, um, uh, who were ruling and reigning, judges, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so their motivation for voting to have a king, you could call it, um, is, uh, is is so they could be like the nations around them, which is just super interesting. Uh, but that's a group decision. Now, here's another one. His blood shall be on us and on our children. Matthew 27, 22 through 25. Uh, once again, democracy is never shown to be a good. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? Yet they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. Now when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, (laughs) he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. You yourselves shall see. And all the people replied, His blood shall be on us and on our children, and that will, of course, happen in 70 AD, right? But this is, once again, this is democracy, right? This is the ruler asking the people what they want, and the people answered. So, once again, one thing you need to know about fascists is fascists and people on the right are not uh, liberal and want things like a representative government. That's not always what we want, um, can you have one? Sure, but it has to be extremely, extremely limited. And I'll get into that because Mussolini actually talks about that. Hitler does too, by the way. They did have votes in Nazi Germany, by the way. They had referendums um, on like the bigger stuff, which is really interesting. Um, so I would uh, the, here's, uh, I think, what God rejecting egalitarianism. This is also what you find in God's word a lot. And it says this, whoever does these things is an abomination. Deuteronomy 22, 5, God rejects egalitarianism. 
A woman shall not wear a man's clothing, nor shall a man put on a woman's clothing. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Remember, abomination is the word toeva. That's Hebrew for like something gross inside your mouth, like absolutely putrid and spitting it out. Right. So a woman acting like a man is an abomination and a man acting like a woman is an abomination. He's using the same word that he uses for like homosexuality, bestiality, incest, um, even like, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, abortion or passing children through the fire. He's using the same term, toeva, abomination, for even things like uh, unweight, uh, uh, unequal uh, weights and measures for like economics and things like that and ripping people off. Like this is a strong word. And, uh, yeah, God rejects egalitarianism. He just does. And here's a great quote from Rush Dooney from the Institutes of Biblical Law. He says this, The law, 20, uh, Deuteronomy 22.5, strikes at the general neutralization of the sexes and the confusion of their roles. The law insists on a strict line of division between male and female as the best and the God-ordained means of communication and love between them. The strength and character of male and female is best maintained by obedience to this law. And what you're going to find, and this is why they call us fascists, guys, is because we're not egalitarian. We're not, we, we don't really care about equality. I know I personally don't because I live in reality. There's no such thing. Men and women will never be equal ever uh, in reality. Now, are they equal in the sense that they are saved by grace through faith in Christ? Of course, and Paul talks about that. I feel like I don't have to show every single verse where that um, is mentioned. So people use that as a, a means to try to distort reality and destroy the lines between the sexes. And once again, this is why they call us fascist, because technically the Bible doesn't believe that. Right. And here's a crazy quote from uh, I forget what uh, author this is, but this is also from the Institutes of Biblical Law. This is Rush Dooney uh, quoting some crazy, some crazy egalitarian. Listen to this. Equality as a philosophical and religious faith is at work. All people are equals. Woman is equal to man and man is equal to God. As a result, there must be, in a principle, a war against differences. Not only unisex, but uniman is the goal. The bland, neutral person. The new world can only come when the old world is forgotten. This means a period of anarchy, racial amalgamation, and universal human hermaphroditism. Doesn't that sound familiar? I forget what the author is of that quote. But isn't that insane? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make the bland, neutral person. They want anarchy. They have to destroy the old world. Now, why do they call Christians fascists? Why does this matter? Because we reject that. We are not supposed to be revolutionary. We are not taking God's world and trying to form it into an image that he didn't make. And he's, and he's not instituted, especially according to his law. The old world should not be forgotten. And this is what a lot of these fascists were talking about. It's very interesting. And so I have a question for egalitarians. I always ask this question. I've actually <laughs> I used to ask this questions of a lot of the girls in my class who are arguing for uh, women voting and uh, being having women in politics. And I asked them this question. Never got, a, never got an answer, by the way. So if you're a liberal or a communist and you want to try to answer this, uh, good luck. But here we go. Um, let me ask a question to egalitarians. God created a government himself through the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. If he wanted women as rulers and leaders in political and and in and leaders in political positions, then why did he not find it important to implement them in the government slash nation he created for himself? And that's the question. Why didn't God put women or at least have a stipulation for women to be in politics and to be rulers and judges? Right. So people always say Deborah. That's a that's a outlier. That's not the norm. And and people say Esther, but Esther was not king. Did she give advice? Yes. And as I showed you, Israel had a queen, but she was a bad queen. And once again, that was an outlier. Went right back to a man, and that was not in God's law. Why? If God made the nation of Israel, why did He not put females in positions of power? Well, it's because they're not supposed to be there. Now, do they not give advice? Or anything like that? No. But they're not equal. We are not egalitarians when it comes to politics, guys. 
And I've never had an egalitarian answer this question clearly, biblically, never happened. And I would say this question can also be related to what we've been doing today uh, in the churches today, uh, to the New Testament, to why to women being pastors today. Right? It's the same principle. One thing I really learned from theonomy is it really helps you read the apostles because their worldview, remember, they're Jewish, they're Israelites, and they use their worldview through God's law. And they might not always quote God's law, but they definitely use it, and you can tell. Um, this is why I think Paul says a man is not to have authority because he's relating it back to the Old Testament. You cannot find a woman uh, Levite. doesn't exist. And remember, the Levites were not judges. They were teachers. They're like the public education system for Israel. So these biblical ideas are some of the main reasons why many call Christians fascist. Many biblical principles, as I just showed from God's law, are anti-liberal. And guess what, guys? That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. We're not liberals. Christians naturally, if you actually study God's law, are naturally right-wing. They're naturally right-wing. They have to be. And this is why I just reject this idea that... Um, Christians are not, they can be uh, left-wing, they can be revolutionary, they can be liberal. I just reject that notion. I reject it. Uh, any person who is a left-wing Christian, so-called, they're a disaster. They're an absolute nightmare. You know what I mean? And so, guys, this is why Christians are called fascists. A lot of the stuff I just read, and, and even the one, guys, where it said the leaders are to be executed because of the daughters of Moab. I used to make this point all the time at my old evangelical church that Phineas is put in a good light because he saw an Israelite man bringing a Moab woman, Moabite woman, into his tent to have sex with her and worship her gods. Phineas, during the meeting that me <laughs> Moses is giving, saying, hey, these guys shouldn't be here, goes in, it picks up a spear, walks over to a tent, and stabs both of them with the same spear, just bo through both of them. And he's praised for it. He's actually given <laughs> He's actually given an award for it, right? And that's illiberal. Some pe people today, Christians, would look at that and go, oh, wow, that's so mean. That's religious freedom, y'all. That's just not how this works. And that's what started to happen to me as I started to study God's law. I started to go, dude, I just don't think what I've been told is, like, actually how biblical politics actually works. And when people started to call me a fascist, I re kind of rejected it at first. I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, but as I, you know, kind of grew up, <laughs> started actually reading fascists, I started going, huh, I might be. I might be a type of, you know, at least very far right, and there are definitely fascist tendencies. Um, I definitely call myself a Christian nationalist, which they'll say is right wing or fascist. Um, but that's because, guys, no, I'm not lying. A lot of us sound like old-timey fascists. That's kind of what it is. Let's, we can be honest about this a little bit. You know what I mean? We can be honest. All right? So <laughs> let's actually get into the reading, right? Let's get into this. Um, so one thing we're going to do, I am going to read pretty much all of this. So this episode might be a little longer but I do think it is important to uh, to go through this. Um, I'll probably blow it up when we get to. I don't think that's no. That's not, this is full screen. Um, uh, when we go to the two pages. But so this is yeah the doctrines of fascism. And once again, the reason why I'm reading this is because I think Christians need to see this. I think a lot of men right now, a lot of young guys, are starting to go back and we're starting to kind of talk about fascism because we're kind of going like. Yeah, why are why aren't we supposed to like read this stuff? Like, what what what's going on here? Like, why why aren't we supposed to do that? Um, because once again, I started reading this for myself, and I started to go, huh. I don't really disagree with a lot of this, you know. Um, so let's actually get into the reading. Uh, this was written in 1932. Uh, there is another man who uh, Giovanni Gentile, I think his uh, name is. Um, some people actually left comments saying that I should read him. I'm pretty sure. 
and uh, about like kind of the doctrines of fascism. I think he wrote a book. I think it's like a hundred pages. Um, and uh, yeah, I really like that. So the other thing that people get a lot wrong with fascism, also, guys, is that people always l- go, um, people always point out and go, yeah, but like these old socialists are like. Uh, these are these old fascists were socialists or national socialism right like i always hear like uh what's his face uh eric july the libertarian uh that black dude who made that comic book or whatever um he uh he i remember he made a video about like uh, why like like national socialists are socialists the problem is is that like eric july's worldview like especially libertarianism is too focused on uh, economics. And when it comes to the political spectrum, I'm not going to lie, I kind of throw economics out the door because it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, because you can do socialist things, but that doesn't mean you're left wing. Um, because that's what fascists tend to do. It's very like top heavy when it comes to, um, and you even say managerial, it's actually kind of a form of managerialism. And uh, that's not necessarily like a left wing position Uh, like this, like he'll he'll get into Adam Smith and stuff and uh, the kind of like free market liberalism and the fascism kind of rejects that stuff. And people always think that like like that kind of stuff is right wing. Like that's what Ben Shapiro always goes to. Like someone's like, how do you Ben? what's a conservative? And he goes "Uh, free market capitalism. And it's just like, yeah, but that's not always that's not always right wing. Like when I think of right wing or left wing, I think of how they view the state how they view culture, how they view, um, like, nations, how they view religion, uh, things like that. I kind of take economics and throw it out the door. I really, I don't really use economics in my political worldview too, too much, if that makes sense. Because um, I found it, like, kind of muddies the water, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because fascists and communists are, like, not even the same. Not even close. Uh, Hitler would slap you in the face, and so would Mussolini if you called them a, a, so, uh, a, a communist or anything like that. So let's actually get into this. Uh, I'm going to stop talking <laughs> in that sense, and let's uh, let's get into this. So there are going to be parts I am going to jump and just get into, like, the meat of this. This is one part where he kind of goes into, like, Italian politics, and I was just kind of like, eh, that part's okay. Um, but we'll get into, like, the actual principles. So here we go. Like all sound political conceptions, fascism is action, and it is thought. Action in which doctrine is imminent and doctrine arising from a given system of historical forces in which it is inserted and working on them from within. It has therefore a form uh, correlated to contingencies of time and space, but it has also an ideal content which it makes an expression of truth in the higher region of the history of thought. There is no way of exercising a spiritual influence in the world as a human will dominating the will of others, you, unless one has a conception both of the transient and the specific reality on which the action is to be exercised and of the permanent and universal reality in which the transient dwells and has its being. He's just talking like he's a realist. To know men, one must know man. And to know man, one must be acquainted with reality and its laws. And guys, that is a Christian thought. I think this is why I, loved, I love theonomy. Because I look at God's law, right, Wh- and like, and I just see, right, like that's why I always think about Romans one. People always point to that, right? Oh, look at the downfall of man. Well, what do you think? What do you think Paul is getting Romans one? He's he's looking back to God's law, and he's going like, yeah, when nations do this, I think of like Leviticus eighteen, all the sexual sins and all the different things that destroyed the uh, pagan nations. Like that chapter is not just about Israel not doing those things. If you read it at the end, it says. These sins destroy these nations. These sins is what brings judgment upon these people. And that's and that's one thing why like I like fascism to me just makes a lot of sense. Because like I love this line to know men, one must know man. And that's what Christianity is. We understand that men are fallible. Men are sinners. They do need control. They do need to be controlled in many cases. I mean, look at us today. Right? And to know man, one must be acquainted with reality and its laws. And I would argue that's God's law. And I think most people on the right wing understood this. All right, So there can be no conception of the state, which is not fundamentally a conception of life, philosophy, or intuition, system of ideas evolving within the... Whoop. I'm going to... Here we go. Sorry. Oh, I actually probably went too, out too much. 
uh, framework of logic are concentrated in a vision or a faith, but always, at least, potentially, an organic conception of the world. And I love that line, an organic conception of the world. Thus, many of the practical expressions of fascism, such as party organization, system of education, and discipline, can, o- can only be understood when considered in relation to its general attitude toward life. A spiritual attitude. So you hear that? That's pretty interesting. It has like a spirituality to it. When it, even down to education, discipline can only be understood, which considered in relation to its general attitude toward life. A spiritual attitude. Fascism sees in the world not only those uh, superficial material aspects in which man appears as an individual, standing by himself, self-centered, subject to natural law, which instinctively urges him toward a life of selfish uh, momentary pleasure. It sees not only the individual, but the nation and the country, individuals and generations bound together by a moral law, with common traditions and a mission which suppressing the instinct for life closed in a brief circle of pleasure. Man, this sounds, it sounds just like what we're dealing with today. Builds up a higher life, founded on duty, a life free from the limitations of time and space, in which the individual, by self-sacrifice, the renunciation of self-interest, by s- death itself, can achieve the purely spiritual existence in which his value as a man consists. That's a great section. Right, right here. That's a great section. Now, I always think of um, real quick. I always think of uh, like that line right there. He he's gonna talk about generations, but I would think of Psalm seventy-eight. Right, I grabbed my Bible and it says, um, "We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come th- uh, to come to the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done, for He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel." which he commanded our fathers, and it's this line, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. Like, I love those lines from Psalm 78. And I I read that section that I just highlighted, and I go, um, man, like, I, I see a lot of biblical truth in this. Right? That we have a tendency to be self centered, but really it has to come down to um, not only the individual, but the nation and the country, individuals and generations bound together by a moral law, common traditions, and a mission which suppressing the instinct for life closed in a brief circle of pleasure. I love it. Builds up a higher life founded on duty, a life free from the limitations of time and space in which the individual, by self-sacrifice and renunciation of self-interest by death itself, can achieve the purely spiritual existence in which his value as a man consists. That's a great, that's great. And a lot of Christians, a lot of right-wing Christians believe this. I read that today and I was like, dang. <laughs> All right. Um, fascists always talked about the nation, about the, the, it, like there's nothing wrong with being an individual, but you have to put aside your selfish ambitions, right? Libertarians like Ayn Rand are like, greed is good. Selfishness is a virtue. It's like, shut up. By the way, I'm pretty sure she's, never mind. <laughs> I think you know what I'm about to say. <laughs> she's part of the tribe, I'm pretty sure. All right, so the conception, I'm going to continue. The conception is therefore a spiritual one arising from the general reaction of the century against the materialistic positivis- positivis- positivism of the, uh, that's the 19th century, so the 1800s. Anti-positivist, posi- oh my gosh, positivistic but positive, neither skeptical nor agnostic, neither pessimistic nor supinely optimistic, as are, generally speaking, the doctrines, all negative, which place the center of life outside man, whereas by the exercise of, of his free will, man can and must create his own world. So he's talking about the Enlightenment. Fascism wants man to be active and to engage in action with all his energies. This is like the Great Commission, right? It wants him to be uh, manfully aware of the difficulties besetting him and ready to face them. This is what fascism wants. It conceives of life as a struggle in which it behooves a man to win for himself a really worthy place. First of all, by befitting himself physically, morally, and intellectually to become the implement required for winning it. As for the individual, so for the nation. 
and so for mankind. It's a great line, right? Doesn't sound too crazy. Hence, the high value of culture in all its forms, artistic, religious, scientific, and the outstanding importance of education. Hence also the essential value of work by which man subjugates uh, nature and creates the human world, economic, political, ethical, and intellectual. The positive conception of life is obviously an ethical one. It invests the whole field of reality as well as the human activities which master it. No action is exempt from moral judgment. No activity can be despoiled of the value which a moral purpose confers on all things. Therefore, life, as conceived by the fascists, I love this. This is I read this to my wife, and she was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> we believe that. <laughs> Therefore, life, as conceived of by the fascists, is serious, austere, and religious. All its manifestations are poised in a world sustained by moral forces and subject, and listen to this, to spiritual responsibilities. The fascist disdains in, or disdains an easy life. And I love that. That almost sounds puritanical, right? Even like what it was saying before, right? Um, it was talking about the value of work, right? Uh, growing yourself physically, morally, intellectually. That's, guys, that's like what's going on right now inside of even like right wing thought, right? Like everyone's talking about working out, the red pill, right? Getting physically fit, having kids, taking care of your family, taking care of your elders. One thing I notice that uh, liberals do all the time, and we'll get into this when we get to the internationalist part during this, is that one thing liberals do is they don't give a crap about their local area. They say they do, but I notice they really don't. They hate their nation, and they want to just send money everywhere else to every other nation. And I really reject that. I, I've always kind of rejected that. I always think about the people who I live with here who I can, actu- who I can actually help. This is why when like guys like David Platt are doing things like everybody should be a missionary, like that's not true. That's a liberal thought. That's internationalism. That's a ridiculous notion. Um, and that's why I reject it. So, the fascist fascist concept of life is a religious one in which man is viewed in his imminent relation to a higher law, endowed with an objective will transcending the individual and raising him to conscious membership of a spiritual society. Uh, This sounds like Israel. (laughs) Like, I read God's law, and I read read the Old Testament. I'm like, this is literally Israel. This is, like, literally what they're called to do. Those who perceive nothing beyond opportunistic considerations in the religious uh, policy of the fascist regime fail to realize that fascism is not only a system of government, but also, and above, all a system of thought. In the fascist conception of history, man... Uh, only by virtue of the spiritual process to which he contributes as a member of the family, the social group, the nation, and in function of history is to which all nations bring their contribution. Hence the great value of tradition in records, in language, in customs, and the rules of social life. And I think of, I, once again, I think of, I think of the Bible. Um, the book of Acts is a great example of this. I, r- I really do. I, it's, it's, Every nation bringing their contributions. Think of even the book of Revelation where everybody brings the nations, right? They're bringing, like, tribute to the king. Um, you know, the Jewish people do this with their writing of their customs, their language, their tradition and records, right? Greeks did this. Romans did this. Like, this is just very normal. This is normal right-wing thought. Um, I don't see any problem with this as a Christian. I don't, I don't really see how this is a problem. So we'll continue. Outside history, man is a non-entity. Fascism is therefore opposed to all individualistic abstractions based on 18th century materialism. And is opposed to all uh, Jacobinistic, Jacobinistic, yeah, utopias and innovations. It does not believe in the possibility of happiness on earth as conceived by the economicistic literature of the 18th century. 1700s. And it therefore rejects the theological notion that at some future time, the human family will will finally uh, will finally will secure a final. Let's see what he says. A final settlement of all its difficulties. And guys, this is that not what we believe? (laughs) 
Is that not what we believe as Christians? Is that not true? I mean, I like I don't know how else to put it. I mean, he freaking nailed it. <laughs> you go off, Mussolini. You go off, girl. Mussolini, Linguini, Fettuccini. You know what I mean? Like, holy crap. Like, I read that. Oh, my gosh. I read that the other day, and I freaking peed my pants. I was like, I don't know how else. Like, right? This is literally, this is literally what we're dealing with today, right? It literally, it literally talking, like, liberals today talk about, oh, like, look how great our economic stasis is, right? Look how great it is. We have, we have, like, video games and movies, and we have all these things. And, yeah, they're nice. But, like, they're talking about this theological notion of uh, that humanity will do great if we just have the arrow going up. This is why I stopped calling myself like a capitalist because capitalists today, all they give a crap about is like the, the, the line going up. And I don't give a crap about that. I don't care about how much stuff I have. I care about my happiness comes from like my family, my God, you know, like my church, my friends, my, uh, even my work, what I do. I don't give a crap about what I have. I don't even, right now, guys, I don't even live in the biggest place, right? But man, if you see me and my family, and I'm not just saying this, trying to say like, oh, yeah, well, look, look how happy we are. We're the perfect family. But me, my wife, and my daughter, and just my family in general, but my closest parts of my family, like we are as connected as you could be, and my happiness is through the roof. And I don't have a lot. I don't have a big house. I don't have a big home. I live in a relatively small place. And I'm as happy as ever. I don't need economics. It's just it's just true. But this is what you tell, this is what you get from liberals and Marxists. Right? And this is what we saw with the with the woke movement, even from the church. Oh, well, look at all these race groups. Look how unhappy they are. You have Eric Mason out there calling for freaking reparations. And saying that's what's gonna make black people fulfilled and happy. And it's just like, no, that's not what's going to do it. Now, I'm not saying that uh, not having wealth or anything like that, like being wealthy is uh, not good, right? But what all they focus on is that. And, and so we'll continue. And, and it is. It's utopian, thinking like that's going to fix problems. It's just it won't. It's not going to fix it. So let's continue. The notion runs counter to experience, which teaches that life is in a continual is in continual flux and process of evolution. In politics, fascism aims at realism. In practice, it desires to deal only with those problems which are the spontaneous product product of historic conditions and which find or suggest their own solutions. This is why, guys, this idea. This idea, this is why, as a theonomist, I'm also not a universalist. I don't think copy-paste God's law is, is good. I think each nation is going to build whatever government they're going to build, based on, which I would hope, based on God's laws. I am a realist. I always have been. I always joke and say, if I was a uh, drag queen, my name would be Miss Real Politique. Okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> like... This is why I reject this notion that fascism wanted to take over the world, right? It it's even says, it deals only with those problems which are the spontaneous product of historic conditions. This is why Nazism is different from Italian fascism, is different from Spanish fascism in whatever country that you have. It's about focusing on the problems there. Whereas liberalism, uh, liberalism and communism and all these different ideologies are internationalists. They think you can bring... Uh, Jeffersonian democracy to all these different countries as George Bush did because the neocons are Trotskyites and Trotsky was a freaking internationalist, right? It was he not, right? So that's like, uh, that's why I, like once again, I read this and I just go like, dude, uh, like how do, how do Christians not believe this? <laughs> you know what I mean? All right. Only by entering into the process of reality and taking possession of the forces at work within it can man act on man and on nature, which is true. Um, you have to be you have to look at what you're dealing with in reality. This is why guys like and I'm probably I would like to go over his video. He's got two parts now. Is that own strand guy or all these different guys who are still classically liberal and call themselves Christians. Um, they you know, they're not operating in reality. Right. They, they're they're stuck. And hence why they can't fix the problem. Um, I This is why I kind of I even also accuse like, uh, 
some guys who I genuinely like, it's like some of the guys from Apologia, when they go into like the democratic republicanism stuff, and I just kind of go like, guys, that's that's cute, but like, I don't think that's going back to puritanism right now is just not gonna. I don't think that's gonna fully fix this. All right, anti-individualistic, the fascist conception of life stresses the importance of the state. This is a capital S, by the way. And accepts the individual only in so far as his interests coincide with those of the state, right? So, once again, I would argue that is a biblical concept, right? Because if Israelites were bringing in their own ideas and doing these crazy things, like they would get exiled, right? That's not liberalism. We're we're that's why I said Christians are not liberals, because they can bring in whatever they want, right? So. And if it goes against your nation, then it's going to cause problems. Hence why our nation today is having so many problems, because we have literally everybody and their mother here uh, of every ethnicity and religion, and they're getting in the way, right? This is why Christians are like one of a bajillion pe- groups of people now. seems like everybody understands this except the Christians. I, I don't know how that happened. Oh, I do, but, but you know, <laughs> I've talked about that in the past. It's because of guys like Tim Keller and others who spread this crap. Um which stands for the conscious and the universal will of man as a historic entity is opposed to classical liberalism, which arose as a reaction to absolutism, which is true, right? Uh, that was when monarchies were kind of going wrong, right? You had uh, the guy who started it. Um, uh, oh my God. King Louis the 14th, right? He's, he's the guy who really started this concept of uh, absolutism. He was like the king who really did this, made the, made Versailles, and then you had uh, the the Fredericks of uh, Prussia. Uh, the absolutism would fail in um, in uh, England because of constitutionalism, right? So, yeah, the classical liberalism was a response to absolutism, and it was a response to mercantilism, right? It was this is what like Adam Smith was all about, and uh, that's that's where this laissez-faire capitalism kind of comes into it. And to be honest with you, I guess you could say this is kind of dialectics. This is kind of the dialectical conversation. And I don't think that's fully wrong. I don't even think dialectics as a concept is always wrong. I think something always responds. That's why I was uh, when I was on the other Paul and we were talking about like our system today. I just said, like, yeah, what is that? And what's going <laughs> to respond to that? Because I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea what's going to look like right now. Um, hopefully that makes sense. But it says this. Uh, it opposed to it is opposed to classical liberalism, which arose as a reaction to absolutism and exhausted its historical function when the state became the expression of the conscience and the will of the people, which is not real. Liberalism denied the state in the name of the individual. Fascism reasserts. It's true. I would I would also reassert that the rights of the state as expressed the real essence of the individual. I would kind of agree with that too. And if liberty is to be the attribute of living men and not of abstract dummies invented by individualistic liberalism, then fascism stands for liberty and and for the only liberty worth having, the liberty of the state and of the individual within the state. I I tend to agree with this, too, that um, this intense individualism, right? I just get to follow whatever law I want, right? I get to do whatever I want to smoke weed. I want to I want to watch porn. I want to play video games. I want to chop my pee-pee off, um, you know, all these <laughs> freaking crazy things. I want to get fake boobies, like all this crazy stuff. Um, I want to be an OnlyFans person, uh, just like this unlimited freedom. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of ridiculous. And uh, I think true liberty, uh, and I think this is what James is also saying when he says that uh, the law of liberty in the book of James, uh, what I think he's saying there, and I've always said this, is that the law that we find in the Old Testament, that's the true liberty. When you live within that that law and you live for your nation and for God, it's better for everybody. It's actually better for you as an individual if everyone is working together. Like, I actually have found this. Um, you see this in the book of Acts when everybody is giving what, you know, if they have something they need, can, they can give, they can do that, um, things like that. Um, all right, so the fascist conception of the state is all-embracing. Outside of it, no human or spiritual values can exist, much less have value. Thus understood, fascism is totalitarian, and the fascist state, a synthesis and a unit inclusive of all values, interprets, develops, and potentates, potentates, I think that's a word, 
the whole life of a people. And yeah, I and those words kind of scare people, right? They they are totalitarian, and like that's something I really, to be honest with you, I just find. Oh, actually, I'm going to read the next line. No individuals or groups, political parties, cultural associations, economic unions, social classes uh, outside the state. Oh, that's a different line. Sorry. Um, it is all embracing. And it's true. Like, I think uh, I do. I always go back to the state of Israel. Right. Like you cannot just do whatever you want. And if you do think about it, God's law is total. Like it, it does control your life. It tells you what to do. It tells you how to live <laughs> um, and how to treat animals and people and all of these different things. Yeah, it's just very interesting. Um, there's probably some disagreement there, but as of right now, I'm just kind of going like, yeah, I like I kind of understand that. All right. So it says no individuals or groups, political parties, cultural associations, economic unions, social classes outside the state. Fascism is therefore opposed to socialism, which to w- to which unity within the state, which amalgamates classes into a single economic and ethical reality, is unknown, and which sees in history nothing but the class struggle. That's true. That's how they view it. Fascism is likewise opposed to trade unionism as a class weapon, but when brought within the orbit of the state, fascism recognizes the real needs which give rise to socialism and trade unionism giving them due weight in the guild or corporative system in which divergent interests are coordinated and harmonized in the unity of the state. So essentially what he's saying there is like, yeah, it's not that we're against like trade because I think, I think Mussolini, I think he allowed certain train uh, unions, but essentially what uh, like Hitler did this too, is that he tried to make the working conditions like the best that they could be. Um, this is why, like, you know, the Nazis were known for planting, and I think Mussolini did this too, um, planting, like, gardens uh, in, like, factory areas and, like, trying to make the factory area, like, a nice place to work and things like that. Um, and that, like, yeah, if, uh, you know, people want, like, a better pay or they feel like they can do better, um, they don't have to go to a union. They don't have to go to a union, but, like, they're – the the joy of the people for working should be unified to what the government is actually doing. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, it's actually in their interest to work a certain way for everybody. And then the state. Um, all right. So grouped according to their several interests, individuals form classes. They form trade us- unions when organized according to their several economic activities. But first and foremost, they form the state, which is no mere matter of numbers. The sons of the, of the individuals forming the majority. Fascism is therefore opposed to the, that form of democracy which equates a nation to the majority, lowering it to the level of the largest number. Yeah, and Christians reject should reject that too. Christians should absolutely reject that. I even teach out of a Christian curriculum at my school, and it completely rejects that. Founding Fathers rejected that, and um, this, is, this is like why Christians should reject democracy. This is why the Christians out there sounding like Obi-Wan when he's like, I'm for the republic, I'm for democracy, right? It's just like, nah, that's, that ain't it, brah. That ain't, that ain't it. Because you know who wouldn't shut up about democracy? The Bolsheviks during the Bolshevik Revolution. All they talked about was democracy. They, demo- they democratized the military and all this dumb crap. So It was, in, it was infuriating. But as a purest form of democracy, if the nation be considered as it should be from the point of view of quality rather than quantity, hey, as an idea, the mightiest because of the uh, because the most ethical, the most coherent, the truest expressing itself in a people as the conscience and will of the few, if not indeed of one and ending to express itself in the conscience and the will of the mass and the whole group ethically molded by natural and historical conditions into a nation advancing as one conscience and will and one will along the same line of development and spiritual formation. Yeah, that's I agree with that. I definitely agree with that. That's some good stuff right there. Um not a race nor a geographical defined region but a people historically perpetuate perpetuating itself, a multitude unified by an idea and imbued with the will to live, the will to power, self-consciousness, personality. Of course. What did I say? At the God gives the people their boundaries and their time. And there's nothing wrong with a people group in their defined region 
choosing what form of government they want um, and perpetuating their life and um, protecting itself. Um, I remember the like, Andrew Torba guy got in really big trouble because he said like you have to it's like it's like a moral good or something like that um, to like preserve your ethnicity and like that's essentially what this is. Um, like a people can defend itself, right? This is it's so funny. Like this is why I critique like the Jewish people because all they want to do is preserve themselves, but then all of a sudden when it comes to like you know white people in European nations, like all of a sudden no 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 you can't do that, right? Like a lot of liberals do this. So, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff right here, right? All right. Insofar as it is embodied in a state, this higher personality becomes a nation. It is not the nation which generates the state. That is an antiquated naturalistic concept which afforded a basis for 18th century, or no, 19th century publicity in favor of national governments. Rather, is it the state which creates the nation? conferring uh, volition and therefore real life on a people made aware of their moral unity. Yeah, I would agree. I think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right. The right to national independence does not arise from any merely literary and idealistic form of self-consciousness, still less from a more or less passive and unconscious de facto situation. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's natural, right? It just kind of comes forth. But from an active, self-conscious, political will expressing itself in action and ready to prove its rights, it arises, in short, from the existence, at least in Fieri, of a state. Indeed, it is a state which, as the expression of a universal ethical will, creates the right to national independence. Yeah, I agree. A nation, as expressed in the state, is a living ethical entity only insofar as it is progressive inactively inactivity is death therefore the state is not only authority which governs and confers legal form and spiritual value on individual hills uh hills but it is also power which makes it makes its will felt and respected beyond its own frontiers thus affording practical proof of the universal character of the decisions necessary to ensure its development i think that makes a lot of sense I think that makes a lot of sense. Right? The state doesn't doesn't just sit there and not do anything, right? Like the law, I, like the Bible talks about it, right? The law is like a teacher. And it tells you what to do, and that's what the state does, right? The, the Romans 13 talks about this. It doesn't wield the sword in vain. It, the state or the nation, like that's the thing I really learned from fascists is they kind of combine the two. Is that like the state really means the people, the the nation itself. And that the nation is like through law is expressing itself like what is acceptable and what is not. And this is why I said at theonomy just kind of took me down this route because I really started to understand like, wow, like law is really important. Right. Like right now, our law system is messed up because we don't really have a law system. <laughs> it's just whoever it feels like it wants to defend and um, perpetuate its evil. Right. So that's like exactly what it's doing. Um and I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, it's this you. It's 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 their will. It's the this people. It's what they want, um, which I think is really interesting. And th and this is why I think like this is what the Jewish people did with their law, right? Like uh, like it says in Deuteronomy, other nations will look at God's law and go, "Oh wow, look at this God!" Right? They're looking at the spirituality and the moral character of their people of the people of Israel, and they're going, "Wow, look how good their law is." There's a spiritual component to that. There is. So it says this. This implies organization and expansion, potential if not actual. Thus the state equates itself to the will of man, whose development cannot be checked by obstacles and which, by achieving self-expression, demonstrates it is it its infinity. Yeah. The fascist state, as a higher and more powerful expression of personality, is a force, but a spiritual one. It sums up all the manifestations of the moral and intellectual life of man. Its functions cannot therefore be limited to those of enforcing order and keeping the peace, as the liberal doctrine had it. It is no mere mechanical device for defining the sphere within which the individual may duly exercise his supposed rights. The fascist state is an inwardly accepted standard and rule of conduct, a discipline of the whole person. It permeates the will no less than the intellect. It stands for a principle which becomes the central motive of man as a member of civilized society. 
sinking deep down into his personality. It dwells in the heart of the man of action and of the thinker, of the artist and of the man of science, soul of the soul, uh, soul of the soul. Fascism, in short, is not only a lawgiver and a founder of institutions, but an educator and a prompter of spiritual life. Yeah, and like that's why I said I, I like honestly, if you were to change the word like fascism to like Christianity, I I don't really see the difference here, because it does like Christianity, God's law really does tell you what to do. Like you can even change the word fascism to almost Islam. Like Islam kind of fu- functions like this. Like I've heard people call Islam Islamo fascist, like Islamic fascist, because it really does like kind of control what you are to do and what you are not to do and like what you are as a member of that civilized society it's a lawgiver founder of institutions an educator promoter of spiritual life and that's exactly how um that's exactly how uh israel functioned it's and (laughs) and this is why i think christians are called uh fascist all right it uh, it aims at refashioning not only the forms of life, but their content, man, his character, and his faith. Sure. To achieve this purpose, it enforces discipline and uses authority. And guys, that is exactly what God's law does. <laughs> enforces discipline and uses authority. Entering into the soul and ruling with undisputed sway. Therefore, it has chosen as its emblem the lictor's rod, the symbol of unity, strength, and justice. So those are some of the principles that I read at first, and I think that's a really good uh, way to start. Um, I am going to jump forward because I thought this part was, uh, I was kind of like, yeah, it's fine. Um, okay, yeah, this is this is essentially where I started to get back into it. Um, yeah, this is, it's, it's just really interesting, right? Like this, this, like just those principles really at first, um, uh, are just like, once again, I, I, I was reading a lot of this and I was going like, wow, like I agree with a lot of that. I don't really have major, major problems with a good amount of that. And I see a lot of how God's law functions in that. Um, you know what I mean? Um, and you can disagree. It's just, that's just kind of what I've seen. Like, I don't, one thing uh, that he says actually back here is uh he points this out i want you i want you to notice the group he says the problems of the individual and the state the problems of authority and liberty political social more especially national problems were discussed the conflict with and listen to these categories liberal democratic socialistic and listen to this masonic doctrines because one thing a lot of people forget is that the masons are a really big problem they were causing a lot of these problems them and the communists so, uh, yeah, let's get into this. This is where I thought it was also uh, getting really good. So um, this might be a longer episode, but I don't really care. I think this is important. All right. So fascism is now clearly defined not only as a regime, but as a doctrine. This means that fascism, exercising its critical faculty, uh, faculties on, on itself and on others, has studied from his own special standpoint and judged by its own standards all the problems affecting the material and intellectual interests now causing such grave anxiety to the nations of the world and is ready to deal with them by its own policies. First of all, as regards uh, the future development of mankind and quite apart from all present uh, political political considerations, fascism does not, generally speaking, believe in the possibility or utility of perpetual peace. Because you got to remember, during this time, there's a lot of there's a lot of dookie butter coming out of the liberals, right? So, this is before World War II, or after World War One, before World War Two, and you have things like the uh, Kellogg Brand Pact, which the Nazis would actually be charged with, which like outlaws war. You have the Washington Naval Conference, which makes it so like everyone's like demilitarizing, which no one was doing, and this thought that there needs to be this perpetual peace. Um, that we would never have war again. This is why we have like League of Nations and things like that. Um, and those are liberal concepts. Those are internationalist governments that are evil. And so the so the fascists are rejecting this stuff. And if you are a Christian, you should too. You should not be accepting these um, internationalist governments like the UN or the EU 
uh, world courts and uh, world organizations, these are not biblical. Um, if anything, they are actually antichrist. I always relate it back to the antichrist himself, right? If you believe that he's going to come back, he's going to have a one world government with an attempt to have a one world religion. And if you believe in this kind of stuff, you are actually causing the problem. And I don't think when Christ comes back and you're standing there applauding the Antichrist for his one world government, I don't know if you're going to make it. <laughs> and you <laughs> and you helped them get there. Once again, guys, I always bring this up. This is why a lot of these guys in Big Eva, uh, like uh, whether I know it or not, I put them in the camp of enemy and I really don't know if they believe they're believers or not. Because I think of guys like, like I always mentioned him, like Tim Keller, right? Like his job was to liberalize and to essentially make Christians Marxists and uh, who are inherently internationalists. Um, this is why he hated white people. This is why he hated America. Um, he was not a nationalist. And he hated, he hated everything that we stood for. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, th- I always thought that was really, really interesting. And he was, uh, he, you know, he said things like, he, he said this before he died, he said things like, oh, what's going to save America is uh, bringing in all these illegals because they're more religious. It's because he hates us, and he's an internationalist, and he's a communist. So um, I know he's dead, but I don't give a crap. I'm going to constantly bring him up because he was a really, really uh, wicked person for the stuff he taught. And so this whole idea of, yeah, perpetual peace, I, I love that he starts there. I love that Mussolini begins here because Christians don't believe that, right? My show is literally called A Time for War. Um, there's a time for hate, there's a time for love, there's a time for peace, and there's a time for war. Uh, that's why I do this podcast. Um, and I think the war time is coming again, hence wh- another reason why I do this podcast. All right, so it says this. It therefore discards pacifism as a cloak for cowardly, supine renunciation and contra- contra- di- contradiction. Contradiction? Yeah, wh- why could I not read that? Renunciation and contradiction to self-sacrifice. I think that's true. War alone keeps up all human energies to their maximum uh, maximum tension and sets the seal of nobility on those people who have the courage to face it. Now, you can get you can disagree with that, right? I, war is a product of human sin, but war is also necessary to destroy evil when it does come around. Um, hence why, you know, the Canaanites needed to be annihilated, um, because they were super wicked. And if you believe in my interpretation, they were giants. And so they were genetically, uh, they were genetically different. And so they had to get, they had to be rid of. Um, so, so Genesis six didn't happen again. So war is actually sometimes necessary, right? Like the Aztecs needed to be obliterated, obliterated off the face of the earth through war. Um, that empire needed to end, um, but yes, it does keep up all human energies to their maximum. That is actually true. Um, it definitely makes men strong. I think that's why a lot of men are like out of shape today and things like that. Men are soft because a lot of men didn't fight war. But the thing is, is, war is also not always, especially the way we fight it now, is always is not always good for society and for men. I actually think World War One and Two is why we're, especially two, it's why we're in a lot of the mess we have today. Um, all right. All other tests are substitutes, substitutes which never place a man face to face with himself before an alternative of life or death. That's that's just true. Therefore, all doctrines which postulate peace at all costs are incompatible with fascism. Yeah, I know we're supposed to have peace with like our neighbors and things like that, but you also need to wage war against wicked, wicked people and wickedness. Right. So. I would actually agree with this, which postulate peace at all costs. This is what you see in evangelicalism today. It's being nice for the sake of being nice. This is why people didn't like me at my old evangelical church, because I'd call people out on crap. And I'd be like, hey, that's like kind of crazy to say. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, you're so mean. It's like, I'm not mean. I'm just telling you. <laughs> all right, so. Equally foreign to the spirit of fascism, even if accepted as useful in meeting special political situations, are all internationalistic or league superstructures, which, as history shows, crumble to the ground whenever the heart of nations is deeply stirred by sentimental, idealistic, or practical considerations. Great line. Right? Yeah, it's true. 
And once again, guys, if you are a Christian, you cannot be an internationalist. It's impossible. It's like literally the opposite. <laughs> That's why I saw a post the other day of some woman being like, Christian nationalists are just bringing back the old nationalism. And I was like, amen, sister. Right. She was like talking about how she didn't like that. I was like, no, 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 no. That's great. No, that's good. All right. Fascism carries the anti-pacifistic at attitude into the life of the individual. I don't care, damn. The proud motto of the fighting squad scrawled by a wounded man on his bandages is not only an act of philosophic stoicism. It sums up a doctrine which is not merely political. It is evidence of a fighting spirit which accepts all risks. It, sign it signifies new style. That guys, this, I'm telling you, this is exactly what's going on with the right wing guys today. Hey, younger guys, if you're listening to me, you know exactly what he's saying right here. I see this all the time. It's the time to fight. That's what I'm seeing all the time. This is why we're rejecting these big Eva guys, and we're looking at guys like a Kevin DeYoung who like can barely even do anything against the enemy and a lot of these other people, and we reject these, we reject these weak men because... You're right wing, and this is right wing, and a lot of Christianity, right? Like, David was in soft clothes while the men were all out fighting. That's not viewed as a good thing. Um, fighting was a good thing in the Bible. It's it, it's not wrong to be in battle and fighting. This is this guys. This is what I'm telling you. If you're right wing and you have this, if you have this like um, desire to fight, like I know I do. This is why I joined Christian education. That's like my way of fighting. Like I go at it with liberals in class. I'm not kidding. I've gone at it with like, and it's worked. Like kids have seen me go at it with liberals and they're, they're, they're like convinced. They're like, oh wow. And like the other, maybe other teachers might not like me um, because of like, you know, my strength, but like I'm there, I'm there to educate, but also to fight liberalism and evil. That's like, that's how the Lord's been using me. This is why I do this podcast. I, I, this is what I see from the right wing today, uh, from us young men, especially who are Christians. All right. It signifies new style of Italian life. The fashion ex, uh, fascist accepts and loves life. He rejects and despises suicide as cowardly. So do, so do Christians. Life, as he understands, it means duty, elevation, conquest. Life must be lofty and full, and it must be lived for oneself, but above all for others, both near by and far off present and future this is why i read psalm 78 guys this is this is biblical stuff man like this is what i think I, like the reason why i you know i used to work for my family's pool company and the reason why i left was because i started thinking about future generations including my own kids um i left my family's pool company because i was exhausted i like i, I couldn't I, there was no way i would be able to disciple my kids now i'm not saying physical work is bad was just the way it was being handled was bad, and so I left to be so I could um, disciple my daughter, you know, and like really care for my family, and it worked, and it helped. It's actually helped me to love my neighbors more. I was just talking to my neighbor today, you know, like asking if she's okay, and um, she gave my daughter a doll, and you know, and things like that, and taking care of others around you, and just that that's Christianity right there. It, and like, and I love this life as he understands it means duty. You know what I mean? And and this is why, like personally, I've kind of given up this whole idea of like, yeah, rights and things like that. I view it as duties. I have duties towards other, towards others. I really do. All right. The population policy of the regime is the consequence of these premises. The fascist loves his neighbor, but the word neighbor does not stand for some vague an unseizable conception Lo like that. I really love how he starts because that's what liberals do inside the church today. They go love your neighbor. So that means you now have to uh, support unfettered immigration. You, if you don't go on a missions trip, you're a piece of garbage. Uh, you, you know what I mean? If you don't give all your money to the third world, you stink. Uh, you're a terrible person. Uh, if you don't give uh, black people everything they want when it comes to politics and reparations, uh, you're a bigot. Like, it's it's really ridiculous. And um, that's why I really like that. W that's what he says here. It does not stand for some vague and unseizable conception. Like, when I think of love my neighbor, I genuinely think of, like, my church, my actual neighbors around me, and my countrymen. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't always think 
internationally. I don't think that's what the Bible says a lot of the times. That is, that's not usually how I've seen it, and I don't think the Bible really shows that. So, the fascist loves his neighbor. Uh, I'm sorry. Love of one's neighbor does not exclude necessary educational uh, severity. Uh, yep, severity. Still less does it exclude differentiation and rank. Fascism will have nothing to do with universal embraces as a member of the community of nations. It looks it looks other people straight in the eyes. It is vigilant and it is on guard. It follows others in their manifestations and notes any changes in their interests. And it does not allow itself to be, be deceived by mutable and fallacious appearances. That's really good. Such a conception of life makes fascism the resolute negation of the doctrine underlining the so-called scientific and Marxian socialism. The doctrine of historical materialism, which would explain the history of mankind in terms of class struggle and by changes in the process and instruments of production, the exclusion of all else. That the vicissitudes of economic life, discoveries of raw, raw materials, new te- te- technical processes, and scientific inventions have their importance, no one denies, though that they suffice to explain human history to the exclusion of other facts, factors is absurd. And it's so true. It's so true. And this is what I just said, right? What liberals tend to do is, oh, we got to we gotta go around the world and we got to give these people all these things. We got to give them, like, you know, water and food and all this different stuff, which is good, right? But what they don't understand is that you can't just give people water, right? You can't just give them food and you can't give them roads and electricity and expect their society to just function. Um, That was the problem with like what's going on with Haiti. Haiti has like a constitutional republic, apparently. And look what happened. Um, and, and, And that's the thing. That's my problem with liberals today is they never account, and this is what, and not even just them, but, like, even conservatives or libertarians or anything like that, like, not right-wing people, they always discount culture, nation. They always discount it, and they blow it off. And that's what he's saying there. He's like, these guys just only focus on the economics of everything, and it's ridiculous. They never think about religion or anything like that. Fascism believes now and always in sanctity and heroism. That is to say, in acts which no economic motive, remote or immediate, is at work. By the way, this is why Hitler could get so many people to fight for him, by the way. (laughs) It's not because he paid them. It's because they believed in it. Having denied historic materialism, which sees in men mere puppets on the surface of history, appearing and disappearing on the crest of the waves, while in the depths uh, the real directing forces move and work. Fascism also denies the immutable and r- irreparable character of the class struc- struggle, which is the natural outcome of this economic conception of history. Above all, it denies that the class struggle is the preponderant, preponderating agent in social transformations. And this is why the woke stuff from these freaking Marxists inside the church, like Chandler and Platt and Keller and all them, um, and what they were all pushing like four years ago was a bunch of nonsense. Because that's what they were pushing. They were pushing this whole, like, economic uh, struggle, and but they added race to it, all right? And, like, that's why, like, a lot of people rejected it. And I guess that would make you a fascist, right? That's a fascist thought. All right. Having thus struck a blow at socialism and the new uh, two main points of its doctrine, all that remains of it is this sentimental aspiration old as humanity itself towards social relations in which the sufferings and sorrows of the humbler folk will be allevi- alleviated. But here again, fascism rejects the economic interpretation of felicity as something to be secured socialistically, almost automatically, at a given stage of economic evolution when all will be assured a maximum of material comfort. Fascism denies the materialistic conception of happiness as a possibility and abandons it to the econo- uh, ec- economists of the mid-18th century. These are laissez-faire capitalists. This means that fascism denies the equation, well-being equals happiness. <laughs> it's so true. Which sees in men mere animals, <laughs> content when they can feed and fatten, thus reducing them to a vegetative existence, pure and simple. This is why they call you fascist. This is exactly what the... <laughs> This is exactly what... Guys, this is why they call us fascists, because that's literally what we're arguing right now. 
This is literally what we're arguing. This is this is right. And like the people who say, "Oh my gosh, those people who have kids, like and uh, have families, these crazy Christians, they're all these fat, video game addicted, Cheeto eating, monster drinking losers." Even though I'm drinking a monster right now, it's delicious. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, right? They uh. They, they, they're they ridiculous. They're all addicted to porn, and they make fun of us. They're usually like these atheists, and they literally think, oh, well, I got unlimited uh, weed to smoke. I can drink. I can play video games. Uh, I can just have as much sex as I want, or I can just watch porn all day. I'll just go work my job and do whatever. And, like, they literally think that. Well, and, and as long as they're safe health-wise and anything like that, that just means happiness. <laughs> And we reject that as Christians. And so do fascists, right? It's so interesting. And it's literally, this is why they call us fascists. I'm telling you, this is why they do it. <coughs> right? Um, I've literally heard people say, I've heard Andrew uh, Wilson argue with, like, liberals and say, um, people have said, if people want to lay in a pod, and just be fed a heroin drip for the rest of their life, they can do that. If that's what makes them happy. Well, because they're having well-being. They're, they're, they're okay. That means they're okay. That means they're happy. When we all know that is not true. We all know this. It's just so funny. They, they always do stats on this. That like, like They always find that people who are tend to have like less tend to be like more happy. <laughs> this is true. All right. After socialism, fascism trains its guns on the whole block of the of democratic ideologies and rejects both their premises and their practical applications and implements. I totally do that. I read I, I read the book The Machiavellians, and after that, I was like, yeah, d- democracy's freaking retarded. <coughs> fascism denies that numbers, as such, can be the determining factor in human society. Yeah. It denies the right of numbers to govern by means of periodical consultations. It asserts the irremediable and fertile and beneficent inequality of men who cannot be leveled by any such mechanical and extrinsic device as universal suffrage. Amen. (laughs) Um, Democratic regimes may be described as those under which the people are, from time to time, deluded into belief that they exercise sovereignty... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> while all the time real sovereignty resides in and is exercised by other and sometimes irresponsible and secret forces. It's so true. This is literally what we're doing. Like, And this is, guys, this is the debate with the whole, uh, like, Constitution thing right now. This is why friggin', like, all these people are losing their dang minds about the Constitution because what we're arguing is, and this, guys, this is why we're getting called fascists. <laughs> literally why. Because we're, we're going, look, the Constitution as of right now doesn't even work. The democracy we have today doesn't even work. So why are we trying to pretend that this is working? And that it's so true. And what it is, is it's all of these elites and secret societies. I've mentioned the book in the past. It's called Conspirators Hierarchy, The Rule of 300. I recommend you read it. It's terrifying. I'm probably going to read it on the podcast one day because... And I'm going to show you the 19 points of things that, like, the elites are doing. And they've all been done. It was written in 1991. It was terrifying. I do not believe for a second on a national level, especially on a, on a federal national level, that anything that we're voting on is actually what's going to happen, right? You have to be delusional if you think that's true. Democracy doesn't mean anything. You, always, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean anything. You can vote all dang day. And guess what? That border ain't closing. You know what I mean? I mean, you even see the stats on like World War II, right? Like they have like they'll have like a stat that said like, oh, 85 percent of Americans didn't want to uh, go to war. And FDR did it anyway. You know, it's it's just like it, democracy doesn't mean squat. And that's what like that. And that's what we are arguing on the right wing, especially Christians right now. And we can have a biblical process in this. We can use biblical law to help us out here. All right. Democracy is a kingless regime infested by many kings. It's true. Who are sometimes more exclusive, tyrannical, and destructive than one, even if he be a tyrant. Is he wrong? (laughs) No, he's not wrong, guys. He's not wrong. 
this is and this is what you see like the, some of the most tyrannical uh people in history including guys like Napoleon he would he got voted in people voted him in and uh he would say things like I am the will of the people it's hilarious this explains why fascism although for contingent reasons it was republican in tendency prior to 1922 abandoned uh that stand before the march on rome convinced that the form of government is no longer a matter of preeminent importance and because the study of past and present monarchies and past and present republics show that neither monarchy nor republic can be uh judged subspecie a tyrannitus i didn't even look that up but that each stands for a form of government expressing the political evolution the history the traditions the psychology uh of a, of a given country. And I'm sorry guys, I believe that. If think something needs to change, it needs to change if it's for the betterment of their people. And sometimes if it's going to be better for people, sometimes you need a more authoritarian government. That word is a dirty word, but it, it really doesn't matter. Like I if you are a Christian, that is just true. I mean, look at that. <laughs> like I, I no, no joke. I hear Guys like from Contra Mundum and stuff like that, Andrew Eisker and C.J. Engel, talk like this all the time. It's particularism. Right? Guys, this is why they call us fascist. It's right here. Fascism has outgrown the dilemma, monarchy versus republic, over which democratic regimes too long dallied, attributing all insufficiencies to the former and proning the latter as a regime of perfection. Whereas experience teaches that some republics are inherently reactionary and absolutist, while some monarchies accept the most daring political and social experiments. It's true. In one of his uh, philosophic medi meditations, Renan, who had pre-fascist institutions, remarks, Reason and science are the product of mankind, but it is chimerical to seek reason directly for the people and through the people. It is not essential to the existence of reason, and all should be familiar with it. And even if all had to be uh, initiated, this could be... This could not be achieved through democracy, which seems fated to lead the extinction of all arduous forms of culture and all highest forms of learning. And that's literally what happened. The maxim, uh, the maxim that society exists only for the well-being and freedom of the individuals composing it does not seem to be in conformity with nature's plans, which care only for the species and seem ready to sacrifice the individual. It's so true. <laughs> It is much to be feared that the last word of democracy thus understood, and let me hasten to add that it is susceptible of a different interpretation, would be a form of society in which a degenerate mass would have no thought beyond that of enjoying the <laughs> ignoble pleasures of the, of the vulgar. And that's, look, that is like Weimar Republic Germany. Like, cut paste right there. That literally describes it. And that's where we are. That's where we are. It's insane. In rejecting democracy, fascism rejects the absurd conventional lie of political equal, uh, equalitarianism, the habit of collective irresponsibility, the myth of felicity and indefinite progress. It's, yeah. But if democracy be understood as a meaning, a regime in which the masses are not driven back to the margin of the state, and then the writer of these pages has already defined fascism, fasc fascism as an organized, centralized, authoritarian democracy. That's why I always like these guys. They never hide the fact that they're authoritarian. Where, whereas, like with a lot of these demo, like these socialists and stuff like that, they're always lying, and they're like, and like these democratic governments, they're like, we're not, we're not authoritarian. Yeah, they are. Now he's going to get into some history here, which I think is really cool. He says this: fascism is definitely and absolutely opposed to the doctrines of liberalism, both in the political and economic sphere. The importance of liberalism in the, I think that's the 19th century, should not be exaggerated for present-day polemical purposes. Nor should we make of one of the many doctrines which flourished in that century a religion for mankind for the present and for all time to come. Liberalism really flourished for 15 years only. <laughs> so true. It, people would actually argue after World War II that it, it flourished somewhat, right, until about now, which is pretty funny. It arose in 1830 as a reaction to the Holy Alliance, which tried to force Europe to recede further back uh, than 1789. That's the French Revolution. It touched its zenith in 1848 when even Pius IX was a liberal. 
Its decline became, began immediately after that year. If for 1848 was a year of light and poetry, 1849 was a year of darkness and tragedy. The Roman Republic was killed by a sister republic, that of France. In that same year, Marx, in his famous Communist man Manifesto, launched the gospel of socialism. In 1851, Napoleon III made his illiberal coup d'etat and ruled France under 1870 when he was turned, turned out by a popular rising, uh, popular rising following one of the severest military defeats known to history. That is what definitely killed, definitely killed the French Empire was 1870. The victor was Bismarck, who never, the Franco-Prussian War, by the way. The victor was Bismarck, who never even knew the whereabouts of liberalism and its prophets. <laughs> It is symptomatic that throughout the 19th century, the religion of liberalism was completely unknown to so highly civilized a people as the Germans, but for one parenthesis, which has been described as the ridiculous parliament of Frankfurt, which lasted just one season. And remember, in my other presentation, Hitler says that. He says uh, that democracy is not uh, German, it's Jewish, and that he praised uh, Frederick II as an absolutist king. That's because the Prussians didn't give a crap about that, and they did. Frankfurt, remember, filled with socialists and communists. Try and it would actually have, I think Frankfurt, is it in Bavaria? Because Bavaria will also later on have a communist uprising. But it's what's so funny is it fell apart. And, and if you think about it, even the story of Munster. Munster was like a weird religious communist movement that happened in like the medieval period, kind of near or near the Reformation, I mean. And it completely fell apart, and they all got killed. Um, all right. Germany attained her national uni outside liberalism and in, a, in opposition to liberalism. That is true. A doctrine which seems foreign to the, to the German temperament. He's right. Essentially monarchical, whereas liberalism is the historic and logical anteroom to anarchy. Thank you, Mussolini. Yes, it is. That's exactly what it is, guys. Liberal. This is why I totally reject liberalism and communism and any leftist thought and I automatically put them in I automatically put them in enemy territory because it is anarchist. This is what we see today, right? Like this is why guys you get called fascist because if you believe in anything like you don't believe in religious freedom, right? Like I like even just ridiculous things like I don't believe in plastic surgery unless it's like, you know, you have to like have some sort of work done medically. Right? People think like that is like authoritarianism. But like that's really just anarchy. Right? You can just do whatever you want. It's insane. This is why I really like this part. The three stages in the making of German uh, unity were the three wars of 1864, 1866, and 1870, led by such liberals as Molk <laughs> liberals, he puts a quote, as Molke and Bismarck. And in the upbuilding of Italian unity, liberalism played a very minor part when compared to the contribution made by Mazzini and Garibaldi, who were not liberals. That's right. They were nationalists. But for the intervention of the illiberal Napoleon III, we should not uh, we should not have had Lombardy. Yeah, don't forget. Yeah, France got involved to um, to help uh, the Pope, <laughs> and without that of the illiberal Bismarck <coughs> at Sadoa and at Sedan, very probably we should not have had Venetia in 1866 and in 1870. We should not have entered Rome. The years going from 1870 to 1915 cover a period which marked, even in the opinion of the high priests of the new creed, the twilight of their religion, attacked by decadentism in literature and by activism in practice, activism, that is to say nationalism, futurism, and fascism. Very interesting. The liberal century. It's so funny he calls it the liberal century. I guess you really could argue that the 1800s, in like 17 going into 18, was the liberal century. You really could argue that. Like, even think about like the popularity of like ma masonry, Freemasonry. Like that is liberalism, which is really interesting. Hmm. I know because I always think of like 20th century. That's always, but I guess you could call the 20th century like managerial, managerialism. I don't know. That's interesting. <laughs> you might hear my little girl playing. <laughs> um, the liberal century, after piling up innumerable Gordian knots, tried to cut them with the sword of the World War. <laughs> Guys, that is true. They made a mess, and they were causing all these problems with all these different monarchies, and the World War just killed all those monarchies and kind of destroyed liberalism. 
It's that is very true. I never thought of it like that. Never ha- uh, has any religion claimed to so cruel a sacrifice. Yeah, let's just let's get rid of these kings for the sake of liberalism through the world war. That's I think that's true. Were the gods of liberalism thirsting for blood? Now liberalism is preparing to close the doors of its temples, deserted by the peoples who feel that the agnosticism it professed in the sphere of economics and the ind- indifferentism of which it has given proof in the sphere of politics and morals would lead the world to ruin in the, fu- in the future as they have done in the past, and that's literally what we're dealing with. Mussolini got it right. Nailed it. It's crazy. Crazy. This explains why all the political experiments of our day are anti-liberal. Remember, he wrote this in 32. And, is, and he's right. Think of even FDR, right, with his New Deal. Right, that's not out yet, but that that's about to come in 1932. This explains why all the political experiments of our day are anti-liberal, and it's supremely ridiculous to endeavor on this account to put them outside the pale of history, as though history were a uh, were a were a pres- preserved set aside for liberalism and its adepts, as though liberalism were the last word in civilization beyond which no one can go. The fascist negation of socialism, democracy, liberalism should not, however, be interpreted as implying a desire to the drive the world backwards to positions occupied prior to 1789, a year commonly referred uh, to as that which opened the de- uh, demo-liberal century. <laughs> History does not travel backwards. This is why, guys, this is why when people call me fascist, I kind of go, yeah, maybe, because like this is how I view history. It, it it's not like we look to the past right to see like what actually works but i also don't deny that we're moving forward it doesn't stand still right and history does not move not travel backwards the fascist doctrine has not taken demetra as its prophet so he's read demetra which is hilarious um right monarchical absolutism is of the past and so is ecclesiast ecclesiastory <laughs> dead and done are for uh for our feudal privileges and the division of society into close uncommunicating castes neither has the fascist conception of authority any anything in common with that of a police ridden state it's really interesting a party governing a nation totalitarianly is a new departure in history there are no points of reference nor of comparison from beneath the ruins of liberal socialist and democratic doctrines Fascism extracts those elements which are still vital. It preserves what may be described as the acquired facts of history. It rejects all else. That is to say, it rejects the idea of a doctrine suited to all times and to all people. And that's literally what I hear from guys on the right all the time. I hear that all the time. This is why, guys, Italian fascism is different from German, different from Spanish, and so on and so on. It's just different. It's it's just this is so funny. Like this is like what I believe as a Christian. Like I, I, this is I just totally understand this and know exactly what he's saying here. This is really not that crazy. Granting that the 19th century was the century of socialism, liberalism, democracy, <laughs> this does not mean that the 20th century must be the century of socialism, liberalism, and democracy. Man, he would be ups- This is why I think he was destroyed. This is why I think the fascists were destroyed because that's what they wanted. <laughs> They made right-wing thought illegal. (laughs) Guys, if you're a right-wing, Mussolini is a part of your tradition, by the way. That's what I've accepted. Political doctrines pass. Nations remain. That's true. We are free to believe that this is the century of authority, a century tending to the right, a fascist century. And I think he was correct. This is why... The, s- the communists and the liberal nations got together to destroy these countries. This is what I genuinely believe that. <coughs> that was a direct threat to the liberal order where these fascists, who were extremely successful. <laughs> if the 19th century was the century of the individual, liberalism implies individualism, which it does, we are free to believe that this is the collective century and therefore the century of the state. It is quite logical for a new doctrine to make use of the still vital elements of other doctrines. No doctrine has ever borne quite new and bright and unheard of. No doctrine can boast absolute originality. It is always connected, and only historically, with those which preceded it 
and those which it, it will follow it. And guys, this is why when people call me fascist, I don't necessarily say no. I usually just go, yeah, I mean, I probably have, and I do as I'm reading, as you're probably listening to this, I have fascist tendencies, sure, because I come from a right-wing tradition which has been formed over centuries. Just like when there are people who might not be communists, but like they are definitely have communist leanings because they come from a tradition of the left. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Everything has a history. Every thought has a lineage. And so this is why, guys, I'm kind of... <clears throat> why I don't reject fascism as an ideology, and hence why when I read it, I don't reject all of it because I go like, well, I believe that, and I actually find some of that in the ideas, like, like ideas expressed even in God's law. All right, so... Thus, the scientific socialism of Marx links up to the utopian socialism of Fourier's, the Owens, right? Yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense. The St. Simons, thus the liberalism of the 19th century, traces its origins back to the illuministic movement of the 18th century, right, the Enlightenment, and the doctrines of democracy to those of the encyclopedists. All doctrines aim at directing the activities of men towards a given objective. That's true. But these activities, in their turn, react to the doctrine, modifying and adjusting to uh, new needs or, or, over, or outstripping it. A doctrine must therefore be a vital act and not a verbal display. Hence, the pragmatic strain in fa fascism, its will to power, its will to live, its attitude toward violence, and its value. And I just, I agree with that. That's true. And that's how Christians should think. That's how everybody, that's how all the Christians thought in the past. Right? That's how they that's how they thought about things in the past. It's in, it's this is it that's why I say guys, this is why they call you fascists, because if you're right wing and you're a Christian, like this is like essentially what you believe. <laughs> the keystone of the fascist doctrine, we're almost to the end by the way. The keystone of the fascist doctrine is its con conception of the state, of its essence, its functions, and its aims. For fascism, the state is absolute. Individuals and groups relative. That's like, let's be honest, guys, that is technically true, right? Like this, the government will always be there. It just depends on what it will be in like individuals in groups go away. They die, right? Like this is kind of what they say about corporations legally, right? Like Disney, Walt Disney's dead, but Disney still exists. The founding fathers are dead. But the republic they created is technically still kind of here. So the, the the state really is absolute. That's I mean, that's how they talk about corporations, like literally in law. Um, that's why they have certain rights economically and politically. So I, I, like, I, I do agree with that. Like people hear that wording and they go like, oh, that's weird. Absolute. That's wild. Right. That's because the state really is infinite if you think about it. Um, all right, so individuals and groups are admissible insofar as they come within the state, which once again, right, that makes a lot of sense. Like if you're literally going in direct opposition to the government, which is what happened, by the way, to Trump the other day, right, they go after you. Instead of directing the game and guiding the material and moral progress of the community, the liberal state restricts its activities to recording <laughs> results. It's true. <laughs> the fascist state is wide awake and has a will of its own. For this reason, it can be described as ethical. Yeah, right? It's, it's, it's so true. This, this is why libertarianism utterly fails, right? This is, this is the whole, like, oh, you have to just, uh, you know, like there's these problems of, uh, of people taking um, jobs from, like, Gary, Indiana, which was, like, the heart and soul of industrialization in our country, and giving it to Mexico and giving it to China. Like what? Like, but according to libertarians, it's like, oh well, that's just the state. At least it's like cheaper now. But while people are completely drug addicted and people don't have really good paying jobs now, right? Like fascists would reject that and say, no, 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 we're going to bring those back and we're going to put them here and where people are going to work here. You gotta like think about that, right? Like that's that's like kind of true. Is that like a fascist government is kind of working, whereas like liberals and libertarians are just like laissez-faire capitalism. Just the invisible hand of the state. 
And it's like, mm, that's not always how it works. That's just not how power works. Um, can the government get involved and, f- and muff it up? Yeah, absolutely. But it's there's amazing, you know, Hitler got heavily involved in the economy and they did really well. So, at the first quintennial assembly of the regime in 19, uh, 1929, I said the fascist state is not a night watchman. Uh, salacious... Salacious? Yeah, salacious only of the personal safety of the citizens. Not not is it organized exclusively for the purpose of, of guaranteeing a certain degree of material prosperity and relatively peaceful conditions of life. A board of directors would, would do as much. By the way, he's also kind of critiquing even what our founding fathers did, right? Like, we always had that concept, like, oh, just pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and things like that. But I've heard people critique the whole idea that, like, were Americans, like, always actually free? Or, like, were they free until we ran out of land going west? <laughs> and I think that's a good question. I think it's a really good question. Um, Neither is it exclusively political, divorced from political realities, and holding itself aloof from the multifarious activities of the citizens and the nation. The state, as conceived and realized by fascism, is, is, a, is a spiritual and ethical entity for securing the political, uh, juridical, and economic organization of the nation. An organization which in its origin and growth is a manist- manifestation of the spirit. I actually think of God's law when I hear things like that. God God has a lot of law on like economics and like things like that. And uh, judicial matters and political matters. Um, which So I, I, I actually agree with that. I think that's like a biblical idea. The state guarantees the internal external safety of the country, which ours does not. But it also safeguards and transmits the spirit of the people, elaborated down the ages in its language, its customs, and its faith. That is biblical, 100%. Psalm 78. The state is not only the present, it is also the past and above all the future. Transcending the individual's brief spell of life, the state stands for the imminent conscious of the nation. That's just This is just true. <laughs> the forms in which it finds expression change, but the need for it remains. True. The state educates the citizens to uh, civism, makes them aware of their mission, urges them to unity. It's just it, it's just as harmonizes their divergent interests. It transmit to future generations the conquest of the mind in the fields of science, art, law, human solidarity. It leads men. The guys, I mean, that is that's literally what I, like this is even like what the Puritans wanted. Right. Like this is what the Puritans did. Right here. Now, you might disagree with this last part, but it says, uh, the conquest of the mind in the fields of science, art, law, human solidarity, it leads men up from primitive tribal life to the highest manifestation of human power, imperial rule. I, and, like, yeah, I, I totally... I, I've heard Jay Dyer talk about how he always thought that, yeah, there, no matter what, men will always have an imperium. There will always be an imperial rule. There will always be some like some strong force ruling and reigning. I tend to agree with that. I've like I've definitely come to that conclusion too, and it's true. That, um, yeah, and like like I I might not always agree that the state educates the citizens on. I guess he says like civics, which is true. But the, yeah, even like the Puritans did. Well, no, that is true. Right? The uh, what are they called? The uh, Levites taught the people. The Puritans had, you, by law, you had to have a school if you had a certain number of people living in your town, by law. It was called the Old Deluder Act. So, yeah, I mean, urges them to unity. Yeah, makes them aware of their mission. Did our government do any of this? <laughs> doesn't do any of this. This is why we're a disaster. They just tell us we got to bring gay sex and Pepsi all over the world. All right, the state hands down... To the future generations, the memory of those who laid down their lives to ensure its safety or to obey its laws. Guys, I mean, this is as biblical as you can get. It sets up as examples and records for future ages in the names of the captains who enlarged its territory and of the men of genius who have made it famous. I mean, what do you think the Bible is? That's like literally what like the Bible is doing. This is amazing. Whenever I, remember, I think this is some of the parts I was reading to my wife. <laughs> Whenever respect for the state declines... And the disintegrating and centrifugal tendencies of individuals and groups prevail. Nations are headed for decay. Uh, prove him wrong. <laughs> That's li- literally what's happening right now. You have so many groups and so many individuals in this country vying for power. Whereas in the past, as Americans, 
we were a uh pretty much we were an american people who were mostly protestants and we had one mind working this is why and this is what happened in germany and this is what happened in italy and all these different different countries this is what happening right now in russia hence why they want to get rid of russia um because they are completely against liberalism and this is why they hate putin so it's it's so funny that is so true and then when a nation starts to disrespect their state and the disintegrating and centrifugal tendencies of individuals and groups prevail, nations headed for decay. That's literally what we have right now. I don't even know how else to put it. Since 1920, this is this is why, guys, I'm like, whatever is going to rise up on the right wing and whether it gets power or not, I have no idea. Something's going to give, though, and I think it's going to look somewhat fascist. I think it is. I think it's going to look old old worldy in a sense if that makes sense because i mean you read something like that and like this this is why like anytime i start reading about nazi germany and stuff it's like it's very attractive and like what's really funny is i'm gonna go over a documentary with somebody about uh germans and like it's so funny they they start to talk about like what it was like to live under nazi germany and you can kind of tell that they were they thought it was pretty dope they just can't say it out loud but they were like oh man the lights and we were just of one group and it's amazing and it was very powerful and like you know that like really in these they ha- they have to act as if like oh but it was really scary but like really on the inside they were like oh no it was actually pretty dope right so um there's something powerful about letting yourself go and being a part of something bigger it moves people and people fight for it um this is why guys people didn't really necessarily like national socialists they did love hitler they did love him you know what i mean so since 1929 economic and political development have everywhere emphasized these truths the importance of the state is rapidly growing the so-called crisis can only be settled by state action and within the orbit of the state where are the shades of the uh jules simons who in the early days of liberalism proclaimed that the state should endeavor to render itself useless and prepare to hand in its resignation. <laughs> it sounds like a communist. Um, or of the uh, McCulloughs, who, in the second half of the last century, urged that the state should uh, desist from governing too much. And what of the English Bentham, who considered that all industry asked of go- uh, government was to be left alone? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> and of the German Humboldt, who expressed the opinion that the best government was a lazy one. Uh, what would they say now to be unceasing, inevitable, and urgently requested interventions of government and business? It is true that the second generation of economists was less uncompromising in this respect than the first, and that even Adam Smith left the do- door ajar, however cautiously, for government intervention in business. Now, you don't always have to fully agree. I don't always fully agree with fascists on like the whole... like oh, the government has to get involved in, like, literally everything. Like, I actually do think there has to be... I'm just telling you just as, like, someone who ran a business with their father for a little bit. Like, if the government was constantly, like, oh, my gosh, just constantly on top of us, like, nothing would ever get done. Um, So there has to be... There ha- definitely has to be some sort of middle ground there. All right. If liberalism spells individualism, fascism spell- spells government. The fascist state is, however, a unique and original creation. It is not reactionary, but revolutionary. Yeah, I, I've had this conversation with somebody about this, that, yeah, it's fascism is um, definitely revolutionary, but it's revolutionary because it's almost using things from the past, and it's so against um, what's going on in liberal countries and things like that. For it anticipates the solution of certain universal problems which have been raised elsewhere. See, that's what I'm saying. In the political field, by the splitting up of parties, the usurpation of power by parliaments, the irresponsibility of assemblies. In the economic field, by the increasingly numerous and important functions discharged by trade unions and trade associations with their disputes and taunts affecting both capital and labor. In the ethical field, by the need felt for order, discipline, obedience to the moral dictates of patriotism. Yeah, I, I get that. Fascism desires the state to be strong and organic, based on broad foundations of popular support. So that's the thing that people forget. They call it totalitarian, and they admit that. 
but they usually have to have like pretty they have to be relatively popular um like right like hitler hitler wasn't just put into power in 1933 by the enabling act because um people didn't want it like they did they like like and then he literally did what he said he was going to do right so uh, Mussolini did the same thing. So it's not like these guys were unpopular. They're actually very popular. I don't care what anyone says. Um, the fascist state lays claim to the rule uh, in the economic field no less than in others. It makes its action felt throughout the length and breadth of the country by means of its corporative, social, and edu educational institutions and all the political, economic, and spiritual forces of the nation organized in their respective associations circulate within the state. A state based on millions of individuals who recognize its authority, feel its action, and are ready to serve its ends is not the tyrannical state of a medieval lordling. It has nothing in common with the despotic states existing prior to the subsequent uh, to 1789. Far from crushing the individual, the fascist state multiplies his energies, just as in a regiment a soldier is not diminished, but multiplied by the number of his fellow soldiers. Yeah, it gets people motivated. Hey, let's do this for the nation. It'll be good for the nation. Like people are motivated by that. They and they and when it works, people are really motivated by that. Um oh, here's something I read to my wife. This was pretty funny. The fascist state is not indifferent to religious phenomena in general, nor does it maintain an attitude of indifference to Roman Catholicism. Remember, he's talking from an Italian um perspective. The special positive religion of Italians. The state has not got a theology, but listen to this. But it has a moral code. And that is the whole argument. Hence why, once again, these guys like Owen Strand and all these ding-dongs who are liberal, um, you know, they go like, oh, you know, it's a pluralistic society. You know, the government shouldn't have a theology. Well, I mean, it will be somewhat theological, but it has a moral code. And where's that moral code come from? Well, what Mussolini's arguing essentially here is from Roman Catholicism. And that's what our government used to be. Our religion is, um, it was Protestantism. That was that was it. That was like what we were ruling by um, for a long time until about two seconds ago in this country. <laughs> and uh, yeah, even even fascists understand this. Um, so they they so the, the the fascists actually don't hate religion. They actually use it. They actually combined it, which is really interesting. Um, this is why when I reject the notion that Hitler was like a an, an enemy of Christianity in Germany. Now he might have had like certain German denominations or uh, Christian denominations he didn't like, but um, overall, I mean, churches flourished in Nazi Germany. I mean, they built thousands of churches in Nazi Germany during his time. Now, if like he was against Christianity, why would he allow that to happen? Well, that's because if you read Hitler, he he understood like Mussolini that religion is extremely important to a nation's spirit and uh, how they function as a people. So, the fascist state sees in religion one of the deepest of spiritual manifestations, and for this reason, it not only respects religion but listen to this: defends and protects it. You would never hear that today. You don't hear that from uh, these uh, these Christians who call you know people who call themselves Christians. They're like, oh, we can't. No, we can't just have rules just for Christianity. It defends and protects it, according to the fascists. That's why I said, all right, maybe I'm a fascist. The fascist state does not attempt, as did Robespierre at the height of the revolutionary delirium of the convention, to set up a quote God of its own. Nor does it vainly seek, as does Bolshevism, to efface God from the soul of man. Fascism respects God of the aesthetics, saints, and heroes, and also respects God as conceived by the ingenious and primitive heart of the people, the God to whom their prayers are raised. Yeah, you'd never get that from people today. That's why they call you a fascist, everybody. All right, the fascist state expresses the will to exercise power and to command. Here, the Roman tradition is embodied in a conception of strength. Imperial power as understood by the fascist doctrine. Now, don't forget, Mussolini wanted to build a second Roman Empire, hence why he was invading different territories like Albania, Greece, uh, Ethiopia, places like that. It's not only territorial or military or commercial, it is also spiritual and ethical. An imperial nation... You know, I'm going to stop there. I go back and forth on whether or not being a imperialistic nation is sinful 
or is wrong. I go back and forth with that because especially with industrialization, like Great Britain, right? Like everybody likes the way we're living right now, right? Everybody likes this. Well, these modern industrialized nations would never be able to function, especially like a Great Britain, which is an island. They, Great Britain naturally had to imperialize other countries. They had to. There is no way they could have kept up their industrialization and moving forward without imperializing. And I kind of think that's what fascists understand. I think fascists understand, all right, if we're going to have this nation, if we're going to have what's going on, like what if we want to continue to grow and be an industrialized country, you would have to be imperialistic. So Hitler and Mussolini's aims were also to be an autarky, which is like a self-sufficient country, and uh, which is kind of communist to a sense, but it's but which they kind of did, but they also you have to imperialize if you want to do that, unless you would, unless you have free trade. That's like the only real way you can do that. But I do go back and forth um, if imperialism is actually wrong. I I used to just kind of be like, yeah, imperialism's wrong. But now I kind of go like, I don't know. I don't know if it actually is. I'd ha- I have to kind of work through that a little more. I'm kind of talking out loud. But I actually tend to think that imperialism is just the natural thing to do as a country, um, which is interesting. So an imperial nation, that is to say a nation, in which directly or indirectly is a leader of others, can exist without the need of conquering a single square mile of territory. Oh, that's very interesting. Fascism sees in the imperialistic spirit, uh, i.e. in the tendency of nations to expand, a manifestation of their vitality. Yeah, it's like that's such an interesting way to put it. And the opposite uh, site tendency, which would limit their interests to, their home, to the home country, sees a symptom of decadence. Hmm. Peoples who rise or re-arise are imperialistic. Renunciation is characteristic of dying peoples. <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> the fascist doctrine is that best that that best suited to the tendencies and feelings of a people which, like the Italian, after lying fallow during centuries of foreign servitude, are now reasserting itself in the world. Very interesting. But imperialism implies discipline, the coordination of efforts, a deep sense of duty, <laughs> duty. And it's spirit of self-sacrifice. This explains many aspects of the practical activity of the regime and the direction taken by many of the forces of the state, as also the severity which has to be exercised towards those who would oppose this spontaneous and inevitable movement of 20th century Italy by agitating outgrown ideologies of the uh, 19th century. Ideologies rejected whenever great experiments in political and social transformations are being dared. Never before have the people's thirst for authority, direction, order as they do now. Does that sound familiar, guys? Huh? If each age has its doctrine, then innumerable symptoms indicate that the doctrine of our age is the fascist. Yeah. I think that's why they killed him. (laughs) I think that's why they got rid of Hitler, Mussolini. I would even say Japan. Japan was somewhat fascist. Uh, they were, you know, monarchical because they had an emperor, but they functioned as like a fascist state to a point. They definitely did. But this is why they had to destroy fascism because fascism, I think, was the the actual threat against the liberal order. And people wanted it. <laughs> people wanted it. I think this is why the World War II narrative. I think this is why they go after it. I think this is why they go after it. It's so interesting. That line is so funny. And that the age is is the fascist. Yeah, and I and I think this is why today people are dying for authority, direction, order um really bad re- really badly right now and I think this is why like people like me and others are starting to look back to the past and read this stuff. That's so funny. Sorry, I'm going to finish it. That it is vital uh, is shown by the fact that it has aroused a faith that this faith has conquered souls is shown by the fact that fascism can point to its fallen heroes and its martyrs 
Fascism is now acquired throughout the world, that universally which belongs to all doctrines, which by achieving self-expression rep- represents a moment in the history of human thought. Woo! <laughs> oh, I just blew the mic out. Uh, putting it down. Dang. Okay. That's it, guys. We did it. There is an appendix, but I'm not doing that. Um, because that was a lot. <laughs> so that's it, guys. That is the doctrines of fascism. Now, there might be parts of that you might have disagreed. Um, but I think overall, you guys are kind of seeing what I'm what I'm seeing. Um, you hear things that Mussolini's saying, and I think a lot of you are probably like, I believe that. I think that. Um, I want that to happen. I would like to see that happen. Um, things like that. Um, but you're going to be called fascist. That's just a fact. You're going to be called fascist. And I think Christians, we don't have to call ourselves fascist, but I think if you're a Christian and you start arguing things like, I don't believe in religious freedom, I think Christianity should be the dominating religion of uh, America, um, no, I don't think other religions should be here, um, yes, sh- there should be blasphemy laws, homosexuality should be a you know crime, abortion should be a, like punishment by death, um, same, you know, th- like all these kinds of different things. Um, even the ideas of like women not voting, things like that. Um, just being anti-liberal. I think if someone calls you fascist, I think I, if I was you, I would just kind of be like, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself fascist, but do I have fascist tendencies? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do. Um, because it's right wing, it's right wing thoughts. And to be honest with you, <laughs> my girl's going crazy in the back. To be honest with you, um, uh, a lot of what Mussolini says there actually makes a lot of sense. So I, I really, guys, I would really start actually kind of rejecting this whole idea of like, oh, we can't be fascist. It's like, well, we might actually be. It, this just might be, we not, might not be called that. It might be called something else in the future because something is going to react to this stuff, guys, this neoliberalism with these socialist tendencies, right? Um. There's communism, right? I, I call it Fabian socialism a lot of the time. That's usually what I'll just call it. Something's going to rise up on the right, and, and it's coming. You can feel it. You can see it, and it sounds very fascist. Um, and we might be a part of that, guys. A lot of you who are listening to this, I, I looked at the stats of like who's been listening. It's a lot of younger guys. A lot of you guys are like, I don't know, 19 to 25, and like you're a good chunk of my audience, and you younger guys, listen to me. You might be. You might be somewhat fascist. You might be. <laughs> and guess what you should start saying? Yeah, maybe I am. And what's wrong with that? <laughs> and what's wrong with that? Huh? Yeah, I, I believe in God's law and things like that. And if that makes me somewhat fascist, then so what? whoop de doo You're a communist. Communism sucks. <laughs> All right? So let's stop being so embarrassed about being right-wing, dang it. Let's get out there. All right? So... <laughs> I really hope you enjoyed this episode. This is a really long one, but this this requires the time to break break stuff down, okay, guys? This, this is important stuff because a lot of people don't want to go in this territory. I want to because I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. And, uh, you know, especially as a teacher, I bring a lot of this stuff to my students, and a lot of my students are really accepting a lot of this, and I think it makes a lot of sense to them, even a lot of the women too, which has been really cool to see. So, all right, so, guys, I'm going to do my outro here. All right. Understand the times. Mark your enemies. Gather your friends. Love your uh, families. Protect the saints. Be consumed with God's word and have Christ at the center of all of it. I am your host, Saint Militant. And remember, there is a time for peace, but now is the time for war. All right, guys. Well, I'll see you guys later. Hope to hear from you soon. Peace. Peace.